Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Welcome to the mother of all talk shows, Midweek Extra. Sunday services unaffected. Every Sunday at 7 p.m., we'll be broadcasting the mother of all talk shows. But because there's a war on, we thought a Midweek Extra would be popular. And boy, were we right. Last week's show was almost as big as a Sunday show with absolutely no promotion time at all. More than one million people have watched the last three, each of them one million plus audience. So it's quite clear that people know that if you want the other point of view, then this is the place to come from all over the world. That is to say whether or not you agree with me, but you may just want to hear both sides of the story. So uh, for the next three hours, me and my expert guests will be dissecting the massive issues unrolling not just across the European plain between Ukraine and Russia, but unrolling everywhere, even in the Cardiff Philharmonic Orchestra. It's the mother of all talk shows because it's the biggest of all talk shows, at least the biggest of all free talk shows. You can call, you can tweet, you can email the show, and you can call in and have your say. People who don't agree with me are given priority. Women callers, priority. First time callers, priority. So if you fit any of those categories, or you're a long time listener and caller, but have a strong point of view you wish to make, make sure that you get on the phone lines now. They're coming up on the screen in front of me. I hope they are in any case, as they always were. It says we're coming live from London, but actually I'm not in London, just to avoid the incoming. In fact, we've dispersed throughout the country. We've gone underground. This is Samizdat Broadcasting. We are the dissidents. Doesn't mean we're wrong, though. Buckle up. It's the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. I might be dissident number one, but that's not because I'm the only dissident. There are very fine men and women all over the world who smell a rat, who understand that they're being lied to, who realize that this tidal wave of one-sided war psychosis and propaganda is not healthy for any free society. And I've got the platform, I've got the audience. But uh, over the next few weeks, we'll be sharing this show with as many of those dissident voices as possible because they all need to be supported and above all, need to be heard. It's been a very difficult uh, period for everyone, particularly for the people of Ukraine and for the Russian people, but not only for them. This is a war that never needed to happen. It never needed to be started. Eight long years ago, 14,000 dead Ukrainians ago. Uh, but it was, and it was a war of choice. It was a war of choice of NATO, led by the United States of America, that encouraged the revanchist, the ultra-nationalist, and even the neo-Nazi forces in Ukraine to lay siege to their fellow countrymen and women and ruthlessly to massacre them. The fact that not a lot of people know that is part of the problem in this story. You heard me famously say some years ago when Israel was invading Lebanon, the clock doesn't start when Sky News turns up. It doesn't start when the twibbons start going up on social media. It starts when it starts. 
And this started in 2014, when the United States of America, nakedly, brazenly, unashamedly, and now no longer hidden, carried out a, a, a massive and violent coup against the elected government of Ukraine. The elected government of Ukraine and its president were overthrown. Its president had to flee for his life. Uh, the parliament building was set on fire, and members of that parliament were at gunpoint forced to sign a raft of laws which made the 30% of their country who are ethnically Russian and speak Russian outlaws inside their own country. The people of Eastern Ukraine, of whom I speak, declared immediately that they would not live as hunted foreigners in their own country, and so armed themselves and formed themselves into what they declared were independent republics. And the Ukrainian armed forces, armed by the West, funded by the West, how did Zelensky get $1.3 billion in his bank account offshore, revealed in the Pandora Papers? That's quite a lot of money for a comedian, even a good one. And it's certainly a lot of money for a president who's only been in office two years. Where did he get the $31 million villa in Florida? That's a lot of money for a comic also. But more of that later. This is where this all started. If you are pretending it started 13 days ago, then you are either a fool or a knave. You are either someone who's been deliberately misled, or you are one of those deliberate deceivers. And you will be unmasked as events continue to march. This started in 2014, not in 2022 and it's time for it to stop. This war is a bloody one. All wars are bloody. The fact that it's very much less bloody than other wars that we're fighting, actually literally simultaneously, is of course of no consolation uh, to the people who are losing their life's blood in this conflict, although it is a point worth making. Uh, that there are no ribbons for the people of the Yemen who are being torn to pieces by British and American armaments, by the Saudi Arabian and the United Arab Emirates Air Forces, with British and American military officers in the command and control centers, guiding the planes that are delivering the bombs that were sold to them by us and are massacring the Yemeni infants, women old people. I saw a disastrous strike took place in Mariupol today, at least uh, unverified, on a maternity hospital and women and children no doubt were maimed and killed in that strike. I'm heartbroken if that is true, literally heartbroken, as heartbroken as I would have been if the Islamist maniac who tried to do the same in the Liverpool Women's Hospital had managed to get through. As heartbroken as I was when the hospitals in Yemen were leveled, when the hospitals in Gaza were bombed and rocketed, when the medics were murdered in their uniforms, in their ambulances, in Gaza, over and over again. If you were not one of those, who cared about those medics, who cared about those women and children, then you are a hypocrite. You may have the alibi that you're an idiot and you knew none of these things, but if you're watching me, you're on social media, and if you're on social media, then ignorance is a choice. The truth is but a couple of keys away on your keyboard. You may have the alibi that you are an idiot, but on the other hand, you may be one of the mechanized battalion of liars who want people to think that this war in Ukraine began just 
14 days or so ago, you may be one of the people who made apologia for uh, the people massacring people in Yemen. You may be one of the Westminster friends of Israel who say that Israel is only trying to defend itself when it kills medical personnel, patients desperate for cancer treatment across the border who die on the other side of the checkpoint. You may be one of those. How can I tell? But whoever you are, at least you've come here and you're going to hear the other side of the story. First, I want to deal with the issue that I broke to most of you. Some of you already knew, but most of you did not know. In the Sunday Mother of All talk shows, when I broke the story to you that Russia had discovered biowarfare labs in Ukraine, paid for, fully funded by the United States of America. I broke this story to you because it was, I said, a game changer. I broke this story to you because of its almost apocalyptic importance. If there had been no WMD in Iraq, but there was WMD in the Ukraine, and that moreover it was held by a Ukrainian government in the hand of the United States of America, and if it was the United States of America that was paying for the bio-warfare research not far from the Russian border, well, that would be a game changer, would it not? Uh, the chairborne division immediately went to work on me. It was Russian propaganda, they said. It was a lie, they said. There were no biowarfare labs in the Ukraine, they said. For 24 hours, that bombardment continued until Victoria Newland, a name to reckon with in the whole story of the Ukraine appeared before a Senate committee in Washington. Under questioning from Senator Marco Rubio, Victoria Newland revealed that there were indeed biological warfare laboratories in Ukraine, that the United States was indeed funding them. And in great dread, of the Russians getting their hands on them. Later, that was amended to, well, they're quite innocent bio labs, you know. They're only researching pathogens, only in Ukraine, only right next to the Russian border, but they're only researching innocent pathogens, in which case, why are you worried about Russia getting its hands on them? If it was research into the common cold, and influenza that you were doing, Ms. Newland, you wouldn't be remotely concerned about Russia getting its hands on your biowarfare laboratories. It is one of the most significant developments of the war and therefore has been virtually completely ignored by the mainstream media blaring out its ceaseless 24-7 twibbed propaganda. If that's all you want to watch and hear, again, I say you're an idiot because even someone that hates me, even someone that hates my perspective on this conflict would be an idiot if they didn't want to hear it. They'd be an idiot if they didn't want to watch it, read it. What kind of people would you be? If all you wanted to watch, listen to, and read was the propaganda that your masters wanted you to. Well, I'm sorry to say, you may be an idiot, but you're not alone. You are plentiful. Never in the field of human conflict in the entirety of my lifetime, which has not been short, have I seen such hysterical War psychosis, even in wars in which we were involved. <laughs> we are not even in this war. 
on the face of it. And yet the British public has been completely militarized. Our football games have been taken over by war propaganda. You go into Marks and Spencer, as I did in an unnamed English town yesterday, you're practically chugged to give a pound at the checkout for Ukrainian relief. I told them, actually, all my relief goes to the people of Palestine. And tell your boss that. And tell them to tell the owners of Marks and Spencer that. The propaganda has reached the levels that not only have Sergei and Alexander been put to death, I presume, the meerkats, meerkats, advertising, compare the market.com have been ruthlessly removed from the public's vision. You cannot even see a video of them before the war started. They've left little Oleg as a refugee in my house. Not only that, not only did Dostoevsky get banned by the University of Milan to international merriment, but today, the Cardiff Philharmonic Orchestra announced that it was cancelling Tchaikovsky. Can you believe? Can you believe the madness of that? Tchaikovsky, the giant of classical music, is no more. What are you going to do next? Cardiff Philharmonic Orchestra, build a bonfire and throw the long playing records of Tchaikovsky on the flames. Perhaps you can synchronize it with the University of Milan. They could burn Dostoevsky's books at the same time. Have you people gone mad? What does Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky have to do with Russia in 2022? They didn't even live to see the Soviet Union, you fools. Never mind the 21st century. This madness, Russian vodka. People are pouring their own Russian vodka down the sink and filming themselves doing it. This is a war that we are not even in. Let me go to the second of the important developments this week. From Idlib, with love. Thanks to Turkey, through the now reopened Turkey hub, Islamist fighters have turned up in the Ukraine to fight alongside the Nazis in the Ukraine who are dipping their bullets in pig fat in order to kill Russian Muslim forces. Al Qaeda brought to Europe by the Ukrainian government with the support of your government, wherever you are in the Western world. What could possibly go wrong? Al-Qaeda, ISIS, coming to a high street near you once this is all over. This is a very important development, is it not? Hundreds and hundreds of Islamist fighters coming from Idlib in northern Syria, in the Al-Qaeda heartland, and being brought into the heart of Europe. That's important, isn't it? Well, you know it is important because the mainstream media, again, have almost completely ignored it. Now, thirdly, I want to uh, deal with what we might call blowback, what we might call the boomerang, what we might call the struggling mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on our own feet. Our leaders, Joe Biden and Boris Johnson, with the bipartisan support of virtually every single member in the legislatures of both countries, who have actually, to all intents and purposes, now become one, whether you like it or not, and I do not, 
The governments of Britain and the United States have lifted a huge rock that they call economic warfare, though they call it sanctions, and they have dropped it on their own feet. Gas prices, which had already tripled, will very soon in Europe be completely unaffordable. Gas that was 44 pence per therm, this time, this day, last year, is now 769 pence per therm and rising. And it's going to rise and rise. So it'll no longer be a question of how much you can afford to pay for your gas. There will be no gas to pay for, and no one except the extremely rich will be able to pay for it. Now, you might laugh at the prospect of Germans and Dutch people and Norwegians and Danes in their woolen hats, unable to turn on their central heating. But be aware of this. The price of gas and the price of petrol affects everything. It affects the price of everything. It affects the ability of every factory and workplace, every wheel to turn, every spark to fly. Nothing can happen without energy. And because our energy policy has been written by a 14-year-old schoolgirl, we have no alternative to Russian oil and gas here in Europe, especially on the mainland, in the European Union, that we thought we'd left, but it turns out we have not. Our energy policy has destroyed our coal mines. Britain is built of coal. We have a thousand years of coal underneath our feet, except it's all been flooded. In the interests of the environment, you understand, you're going to freeze and potentially go hungry in the interests of the environment. When you can no longer afford petrol or diesel for your car, and that day is coming very soon. It's just as well they don't price petrol in gallons now in the United Kingdom, because if they did, you'd know that you are virtually at eight pounds a gallon. And that by the end of this month or the month after that, you may be at 10 pounds per gallon, meaning that you can afford to drive virtually nowhere at all. But don't worry, Sadiq Khan has built a lot of bicycle lanes for you. Our sanctions are self-harming. They are a gigantic act of self-harm. Russia has just announced the list of countries and the list of commodities and raw materials that will no longer be allowed to be exported from Russia to a list of named and specific countries, one of which is ours here in the United Kingdom and one of them is yours out there in the United States of America. No oil, no gas, no wheat, no neon, no nickel, no silver, none of the precious metals that are required for all the important industrial and technological functions that take place in our economy, in our country, all banned all in the name of sanctions. Russia, meanwhile, has sold every cubic liter of gas to its east. It has sold every bushel of its wheat to its east. It will supply these vital commodities in abundance to its east. We are led by men who did all this rather than, rather than announce that Ukraine will never join NATO. Just think about that. That's what this war is all about. 
rather than state that Ukraine would be a neutral country, neither east nor west, like Switzerland, that it will not join any military bloc, it will not have anybody else's foreign military weapons on its soil, rather than just say that. All of this blood has been spilt, and all of this economic ruin has been wrecked by our leaders, our governments. Makes you wonder, huh? Doesn't it make you wonder? Now, in the course of, let me check, what's the time? Nobody's telling me the time. It's 7 25, I've been speaking for 25 minutes. Just another couple of minutes, if I may. The economic ruin and the blood and gore was, of course, nothing like the first 13 days of the Anglo-American attack on Iraq. There are civilian casualties in Ukraine. Uh, but they are numbered in the hundreds. 13 days into our invasion of Iraq, the civilian casualties were numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands were dead by this stage of the Anglo-American invasion and then occupation of Iraq. But several hundreds is far too many. Several hundreds to be added to the 14,000 in the last eight years in eastern Ukraine is far too many. Uh, this war must end. It will end one way or another. It will end with Ukraine as a neutral country, either by its own declaration or by its conquest. It will end uh, with the Ukraine no longer available for the warmongers in Western countries, for the armed forces, and for their weapons from Western countries. It will end with no foreign mercenary left on Ukrainian soil. It will do so one way or another, preferably by negotiation. And before any more blood is shed, but if not by negotiation, it surely will be achieved by force of arms. Russia has been fighting this war with deliberately one arm behind its back. If it had acted like Britain and the United States, every city in Ukraine would have been leveled, would have been leveled by constant bombardment. The Russians have had air support superiority from the first days of the war. There would be no building left standing with ultra-nationalists or Nazis inside it if Russia had behaved as Britain and America has behaved. But thank God they have not, even though it has cost them military casualties not to do so. Having to take some place by land force is, of course, a much more expensive way from the point of view of your own casualties. But thank God that they have. Pray to God that this conflict ends now. It's only going to end one way, and no amount of NATO weaponry being stuffed down the throat of the Ukrainian people is going to change that outcome. Everybody with any sense who knows anything about the military out there already knows that. Right after this next break, I'll be introducing you to Scott Ritter, the former United Nations arms inspector who trawled all over Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction and never found them. He's a former U.S. Marine. He's nobody's idea of a peacenik, but he's joining me to talk about the war between Russia and the Ukraine in just a couple of minutes. Now, the poll was the US within its rights to have biowarfare labs in Ukraine. Yes, A, 
B, no. You can vote on my Twitter, on my Telegram, and on my YouTube channel. I need a break for just two minutes. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. I can't believe I'm reading this. We've got new subscribers in Martinique, Fiji, Cambodia, Mauritius, and Georgia. That's not Georgia, USA, but Georgia in the Caucasus. And that means we now have subscribers in 130 countries. And we've been in the political top 10 in Russia, South Africa, Singapore, and the Philippines. And this actually is because our Maxwell the Monster podcast was released on all of our podcast platforms. So please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. You can listen to Moats anytime, anywhere. And leave us, by the way, a five-star review if you would. Here's one. I listen in from Saudi Arabia and play your podcast on the commute to and from daycare. Not sure what my two-year-old gets out of it, but I certainly enjoy your perspective and the diversity of guests you have on. Thanks, Gigi. Thanks to you and to your two-year-old. Global Higher Education with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts, the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You're watching the Midweek Extra, mother of all talk shows. Thank you for doing so. You've shown that you're a person with at least the intelligence to want to hear all sides of the story. I have known my first guest this evening, Scott Ritter, for more than 20 years. I was defending the people of Iraq when he and his fellow arms inspectors were crawling all over it, fully expecting to find nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons facilities, because that's what the political masters of the universe had told them that was present in Iraq. Scott Ritter was one of the very earliest to tell the truth, that there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Let's hear what he has to say about the WMD now discovered in Ukraine. Scott Ritter, thank you for joining us. Uh, I was myself startled last Sunday when the news broke for the first time from the Russian Defense Ministry, but I kept a large pinch of salt uh, in case it wasn't uh, true. But then Victoria Newland confirmed it in front of the Senate just yesterday, didn't she? Well, she she confirmed that there were biological research labs. She um, did not confirm that there were biological weapons or biological warfare labs. But the uh, distinction between the two is uh, is sometimes a very narrow one. And the United States has for many years been walking a very thin line between what is permissible under the Biological and Toxins uh, Weapons Convention um, under Article One and uh, what is prohibited. And I think uh, when the when the data is shook out, we're going to find out that uh, what was going on in Ukraine uh, clearly falls in on the prohibited side. Uh, we know this from Robert Pope, the uh, director of the uh, the program uh, that that uh, the De Department of Defense program that operated these labs. He uh, he gave a press conference uh, right at, right before the war started, where he was worried that the Russians might uh, turn off the electricity or somehow uh, bomb the power generation capability of these labs, saying that the uh, samples that are there, the pathogen samples, which are frozen, uh, would thaw out. And then if the uh, facility was damaged, they would be released. Um, and if that's a legitimate worry. But then he went on to say something that I wish Marco Rubio had followed up with Victoria Newland. He said, some of these facilities are newly manufactured. Some of them date back to the Soviet biological warfare period, meaning they are biological warfare facilities. And he said, scientists being scientists, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that 
some of these scientists preserved the very weapons they were working on. So yes, these are literally biological warfare facilities because they store, they have retained um, samples of biological warfare agent that have no use in any preventive uh, biological research, uh, defensive biological research. They can only exist if somebody seeks to replicate them in the future as part of a reconstituted biological weapons program. So uh, it's a little snide to say this, but Russia has succeeded in Ukraine where the United States failed in Iraq by invading a country with a viable biological warfare capability. Yes, uh, it's one of the great ironies. Uh, no WMD in Iraq, just a million dead people, just ISIS and Al-Qaeda cascaded around the world, just a grand canyon of hatred opened that will never uh, be closed. Um, and there were no WMD at all in the end. Let me move on, if I may, to uh, tax your uh, military um, background and your military knowledge. I said... Uh, and I'd like your view on it, uh, that uh, Russia has been fighting this war with one hand deliberately behind its back. If it had wanted to, it could have uh, flattened every city in Ukraine in the way that we did in Iraq in 2003. Am I right about that? Yes, I have to admit that um, when Russia initiated this action, I was one of the people that believed that they would use their doctrine in, in pursuing their military objectives. And that is to combine overwhelming firepower, that is massed artillery strikes, which literally devastate the area in front of them, followed up by massed armor assault through that area, penetrating and moving on and repeating as necessary, literally destroying everything in its path. And this is a military that's fully capable of doing this. And I was a little shocked when I saw that they weren't. And you know, two things. One, we have um, Ukrainian friends who are very anti-Russian, but they have family back in Ukraine who they, of course, call back to check in on. And early on, uh, their family members said, oh, the Russians are here. And they said, well, how's it going? Are they you know, brutalizing you? And they, no, they're very polite. They, uh, they're, they're very polite. They, they, they say, please just live your life. They let us fly the Ukrainian flag. Uh, they just say, get out of our way because we're going to accomplish our mission, but we don't want to interfere with you. We don't want to do anything. And then she said a couple of days later that the Ukrainian forces had counterattacked, taken advantage of the Russian softness, pushed the Russians back. She said the Russians refused to defend in the urban area because they didn't want to cause civilian casualties. Um, and then I listened to a Russian general, and he said, in Ukraine, we are using the Syrian tactics. Now, many people in the West will say, aha, I knew it. That means they're going to bomb Aleppo into the dirt. The Russians didn't bomb Aleppo into the dirt. What the Russians did do is work with the Syrian army to surround urban areas where these jihadists had been gathered, terrorizing the population, surround them, and then give them the opportunity to evacuate on buses with their security guaranteed by Russian military police a soft approach that protected civilians, protected civilian areas. And the general said, we're doing this. And he said, we have paid a heavy price for this. We, you know, we, he said, well, we have destroyed the Ukrainian ability to fight a cohesive battle, meaning divisions coordinate with divisions, et cetera. They still have the ability to operate on the battalion and brigade level. And they are cutting off our convoys. They're killing our boys. Uh, because we're coming in soft. To give you an example, in Kharkiv, Kharkov, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, Russian Spetsnaz went in with the intention of negotiating uh, their way through. The uh, deputy mayor who met with them was assassinated by the Azov Battalion for collaborating, and the 15-man detachment that had been sent in there was surrounded and annihilated by the Ukrainians, who were fighting in an urban area. And people say, well, why are the why are the Russians bombarding residential areas in Kharkov, um, you know, they're, they're protecting, so because the Ukrainians are dug in there. They're dug in there, they're putting their equipment there. And now Russia has taken a pause. And the feeling is, and I think I've heard a Russian general say this, that they're giving the Ukrainians one last chance to bring this thing to an end. They've, they've 
in front of the Korean, Ukrainian government with a fait accompli. <laughs> the Ukrainian government knows they've lost. Anybody, anybody who isn't paying attention to the propaganda knows Ukraine has lost this fight. Now it's just down to the bitter, bloody end. It's like when the Russians crossed the Vistula and came up to Berlin. The Germans had lost, but they still fought a bloody battle for Berlin that cost both sides a lot of lives. So there's still a lot of fight left in Ukrainians, but it's fighting in support of a lost cause. If the Ukrainians refuse the Russian offer, which I believe Lavrov will make tomorrow in Turkey, um, the Russians are coming in hard. Not that they're going to try and target civilians, but it's gloves off when it comes to the Ukrainian military. They will, because up until now, the Russians have treated the Ukrainian military as their Slavic brothers, meaning we understand you're resisting us, we understand you're defending your country, um, but we don't want to slaughter you like we could. Well, that's over. And I think what we're going to see in the days to come, if Ukraine doesn't capitulate according to Russian terms, is a completely different battle where it will literally be hell on earth for the Ukrainian people and for the Ukrainian military. And as somebody who has studied the Russian way of war, I don't wish that on my worst enemy, unless, of course, they're neo-Nazis or jihadists. Um, how likely is it that uh, in Turkey agreement will be reached in your view, Scott? <laughs> You know, that it's 50-50 at my point, because I've, I've listened to Zelensky speak, and he's all over the map. I mean, he's literally a bipolar individual. But on occasion, he's, he will say things such as, um, why would I ever want to be a member of NATO? They've betrayed me. Why would anybody want to be a member of, a member of NATO? They betrayed me. So maybe I would accept neutrality if I could get you know, written guarantees for my security, which, of course, Russia will give them. So we know Zelensky uh, is going could is capable of at least talking about accepting that term about Donbas, the Lugansk and, and Donetsk. He said, "Why do it's just a, a poor poll mine? Why do I want that? G give it to them. Give it to them." So he seems to have accepted the, um, the 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 notion that those are independent entities now that'll never again be part of Ukraine. On Crimea, he said, "I'm open to discussing." something that respects the will of the people, like a referendum that he participates in. And if that's the case, they'll vote to be independent. He'll accept that. So it appears that there is the potential of this, but that's whenever Zelensky gets away from his handlers. Then Zelensky is brought back in, and people need to understand this. He is being managed by a CIA MI6 conglomerate. And you and I have talked about in the past what MI6 did with Iraq, Operation Mass Appeal that information operation uh, where they planted information, psychological warfare to try to create a perception in the British public conducive to supporting the war in Iraq. Well, the CIA does the same thing, and they're doing it right now. Where do you think the, uh, the 13 brave defenders of uh, Snake Island came from? They wrote that. Where do you think the ghost of Kiev came from? The CIA wrote that. We know <laughs> the New York Times, or I forget who reported, maybe... Uh, Associated Press or somebody was honest about the uh, the the I don't need a ride I need ammunition line that Zelensky is now famous for. Nobody ever quoted him. They quoted an unnamed U.S. intelligence official who quoted Zelensky. I mean that was the most honest anybody's been. And then this ridiculous speech he gave to the British Parliament, uh, you know, bringing up Churchill, bringing up Henry V. Uh, you think Zelensky wrote that? No. That was written by his CIA MI6 handlers. And the sad thing is the British Parliament allowed themselves to be debased in that fashion. Here is the one of the oldest institutions of democracy in the world. And it allowed itself to be used by its own intelligence service to spread propaganda, to propagate a lie. Shame on the British Parliament and shame on the British people for allowing this to happen. Just like I say, shame on the American people and the American Congress. But I mean, at least we haven't been used it. Well, we did, I guess. Uh, Zelensky spoke to the U.S. Senate the same way. So yes, we're both guilty of having our various democratic institutions um, be humiliated by being nothing more than a pawn for their respective intelligence services. In America, this is yes, illegal. Uh, a clack, uh, 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 clapping like seals. The last time I saw a standing ovation in the British Parliament, I was there. And the only one 
not standing was on the day that Tony Blair left office as prime minister. He put his pen down on the dispatch box, made to walk out for the last time, and the entire assembly stood and clapped like seals. Um, they're not clapping now about uh, Tony Blair and the Iraq war, and the Iraqi people certainly are not. Uh, a couple of other things, because of your expertise, if I may. Uh, the uh, presence now in Ukraine this day of Islamist fanatic, throat-cutting, head-chopping uh, Islamist fanatics brought from Idlib through Turkey. Uh, why would they do that? And what are the dangers of them having done so? Well, first of all, you, you can judge. Uh, let me give you an example by answering this way. There's been a lot of propaganda that Russia has uh, brought in mercenaries, uh, the Wagner Group, and that Russia was going to bring in Syrian fighters. I can tell you with absolute certainty that the Russian military, which is one of the most professional militaries in the earth, it doesn't mean they're infallible, it doesn't mean they can't make mistakes, but they're professional. Their officer classes are, are some of the finest trained military professionals in the world. They would never allow mercenaries to fight alongside their soldiers. They would never allow in, 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 in a Russian operation in Europe to allow uh, Syrians to, to join them. Why? It will diminish their combat capability. Uh, they train to fight with each other. As soon as you bring in the Syrians, uh, the Syrians can't do what the Russians do. There is a decrease in combat effectiveness and people die. So Russia would never do this because they're military professionals. What has Ukraine done recently? A, they've given out 25,000 weapons to civilians, um, which is stupid. Uh, if, if you've ever seen the movie Downfall about the Battle of uh, Berlin, there's a scene yes. in there where General yeah. Trump, uh, responsible for the professional German defense of the city, is watching the Volkssturm and the, and, the, and, the, and the Hitler youth run through the street and get slaughtered. And he's basically saying, why are they here? They can't fight. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know any concept of fire, cover, concealment, et cetera. And he went and begged to take them off the field of battle. Himmler, of course, said no. But Zelensky has given weapons to civilians who will literally be slaughtered if it comes time to fight. He has freed prisoners from prison to fight. He has opened the door for illegal warriors, the, the, the mercenaries from Europe, who, if are captured by Russia, will more than likely be given a cursory trial, put up against the wall, and shot because they have no rights or protections. They're the worst kind of scum, the exploiters of conflict. And now what does Zelensky's government do? They brought in the jihadists. They brought in the people because they ostensibly want to kill Russians. It's a pure propaganda move, but it's a poison pill. Not for Ukraine, because Ukraine's going to be destroyed. I, I doubt Zelensky's going to be able to come up with a peace agreement. And Russia has said if he fails to do so, it will be the end of the Ukrainian nation as we know it today. It, it will be destroyed. Um, but now we're going to have these jihadists who are being armed, by the way, with javelin missiles and stinger missiles. Now imagine what happens when a bunch of bloodthirsty jihadists take this, these weapons into Europe. Would you like to be the, 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 the German chancellor driving on a highway knowing that up in the hills could be a jihadist hit team armed with javelins that will take you out? Would you like to be the president of the United States visiting Germany knowing that up in the hills they're in? Would you like to be trying to land Air Force One uh, on, on, in, a, in, a, in an airport in Europe knowing that there's Stinger missiles down there ready to shoot you down? This is literally the worst kind of decision making ever. A, to put that much weaponry into Ukraine in an uncontrolled fashion. Because even before the jihadists came in, you're giving it to neo Nazis who can't surrender. They can't surrender because they'll be killed, rightfully so. So, what do desperate people do when they can't surrender and they don't die? They run away with the weaponry they have. They'll be burying it, making caches, falling back on it, continuing a feudal resistance. And in their anger to the West, they'll lash out at the West and become you know, global terrorists. That's how global terrorism is born. This is literally the worst possible decision one can make, and it will have heavy consequences for years to come. Lastly, and you've touched on it uh, several times, uh, all the big uh, media organizations over the last eight years, the New York Times, CNN, BBC, uh, all, all the big outfits have reported on Ukraine's 
neo-Nazi problem. But suddenly they've all forgotten about it and are averting their eyes from it. Uh, you're now a conspiracy theorist for drawing attention to something that they have all made programs about and written extensively uh, about. How big is the neo-Nazi slice uh, of Ukrainian political and especially military strength? Well, if we're if we're going to be you know dead honest, uh, it's it's a minority. It's a distinct minority. Um, if if left to normal political affairs, they would be struggling to get more than single digits in terms of voter support. Um, the problem isn't that you know their their role in a viable democracy. Their problem is the role they play in a state formed of violent revolution. Um, you know, in the Soviet revolution. Uh, the Russian Revolution, you had the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. The Mensheviks are the minor party, the Bolsheviks are the big party, but the reality was this was propaganda. The Bolsheviks are actually the smaller party, the Mensheviks were the bigger party, but the Bolsheviks through violence and action were able to take control of the revolution. When the Maidan occurred initially, it was a peaceful demonstration against uh, the, the the, the, the Russian or the Ukraine, the pro-Russian Ukrainian president's uh, choice to move away from the European Union towards Russia. What happened is the United States and European Union mobilized this virulent nationalist group out of Lvov in western Ukraine, among whom were these neo-Nazis who worshipped Stepan Bandera and the, Band, uh, the Banderista movement, uh, which was a pro. Nazi Ukrainian national movement carried out a resistance in that area for decades. Um, these guys came in and took over Maidan, violently overthrew the, the, the legitimate president of Ukraine, and then imposed themselves through force of violence into the Ukrainian body politic. To give you an example of how powerful they are, when Poroshenko, who was the president before Zelensky, uh, negotiated the Minsk Accords in 2015, 2014, 2015, you know, he agreed that all they had to do is give a special autonomous situation to their status to the Donetsk and Lugansk, and they would stay part of Ukraine. He agreed with Germany and France. Then he came back and the neo-Nazis said, if you try and implement that, we'll kill you. Americans get upset with a bunch of rioters taking the capital and then leaving the same day. I get upset about it. I'm not happy about it. But the, it ain't an insurrection. An insurrection is what happened in Ukraine. What's happening every day. Zelensky was told. He was elected to be the president who brought peace. If you remember, Zelensky toured the front line because they were supposed to disarm. And he went up to the Azov battalion and he said, disarm. And they laughed at him, kicked him out. He said, I'm the president of Ukraine. They said, shut up. We'll slap you. He had to leave. And he was told, if you sign Minsk, we will hang you by the neck until dead. That's the control these people have. And they've done it in the military. They, you know, these people should have been disbanded, arrested, shot. Instead, the military absorbed them and then promoted their officers throughout the ranks so that there's neo-Nazis everywhere. And the biggest embarrassment of all is when British, American, and Canadian troops go to Ukraine to train that military and NATO tactics, NATO equipment. The photographs show that they're training the Azov Battalion because those were the first units the Ukrainian military brought forward for training. We trained Nazis, literally. Unbelievable. Scott Ritter, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Much obliged to you for your military uh, expertise. Uh, Jesus Camacho says, I live in the Chicago area in the U.S. and I'm fond of international food food of the world. So I decided I wanted some Russian or Ukrainian food and decided to look for a grocery store or a restaurant. Uh, this was about two months ago. So I found a store on Cumberland Avenue named Stephanie's European Foods. And while I was there ordering food, an employee behind the counter of the meats made a Nazi salute and smiled and looked towards me. But out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that she was looking at somebody else. I quickly turned around and I saw this guy with a funny European 1940s, 1950s, looking down at the floor with no smirk 
or smile. I have no idea why I'm being given this to read. Uh, Brazil, Basil says, George, great show. Could I ask what you think of the chance that the US has implemented a similar tactic with a NATO EU diversion? I've got so much more social media, uh, but there's the phone numbers now on the screen. Uh, if you are in the UK, it's 08081 965522. It's entirely free, 0808196552. If you're in the United States, it's also toll free. It will cost you nothing at all. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Can I take my first call of the evening from Jonathan in California? Go ahead, Jonathan. George Galloway, it's a pleasure to be on with you, um, calling from Communist yes, California mine. Thank you. once again. Thank you. Now, uh, George Galloway. Nice to hear from you. Uh, likewise. Uh, George Galloway, so uh, one quick request for your guest, Scott Ritter, if he could please try to make an appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast. I know that he reaches every inch of the world as far as his podcast popularity, and Scott Ritter with his background and uh, expertise in weapons, especially his history with Russia, would be an amazing guest to hear for three hours, go into detail. I believe Joe Rogan has, you know, and uh, from his previous episodes, mentioned Ukraine and the war in Russia, excuse me, the war in Ukraine with Russia. And uh, it, I know um, that he might have some good insights, but just a, a guy who's a military expert like Scott Ritter as a guest would There's be no an substitute amazing, for amazing. That. No substitute Sorry. for that. Well, I hope that uh, Joe will do that because Scott Ritter is the expert's expert. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. So my question would, was going to be about censorship. It's just that when I heard you speak with Scott Ritter, I couldn't help myself but to make that uh, request over the phone. But my no, question no, would welcome. be uh, is with regarding censorship, I know that the U.S. now in California specifically, the, uh, our, our beloved governor, and that's a joke, is uh, passing bills to uh, raise the minimum wage. In my opinion, that's a big propaganda because uh, they will keep Americans dumbed down. Uh, they won't ask the tough questions on, as to why is the minimum wage going up. Of course, we see the gas prices and, and a lot of Americans specifically in California uh, with with the way things are going and in, with inflation, we just have no well, not me, but most Ameri most Americans here in California have no idea what's going on. And other than the propaganda force just telling us it's Russia's fault, it's Russia's fault. I think it's much deeper than that, of course. Uh, well, whoever uh, whoever's fault it is, uh, it will be taken out on the politicians uh, that can be reached uh, by the people, and the people in California can't vote out Vladimir Putin. But they can sure vote out uh, the Democrats uh, in the midterm elections, and I'm sure they will. I hope so. To be honest with you, I'm going to vote for anybody who's against uh, tyranny and totalitarianism. Uh, right now, we, I mean, the way California is, is a majority of, of Democrats uh, sitting in almost every office. A few Republicans, yes, but not enough, in my opinion. But either way, it's Republican or Democrat. We need a new system. We need more than just two-party system. Uh, my question is regarding the censorship. Do you believe that we will be bombarded with censorship and then uh, be hit with propaganda regarding false flags? Well, I absolutely believe that the march of state control over our, our lives has reached a dangerous pitch. Uh, so much so, uh, I'm prepared to ally myself uh, with, uh, with anyone uh, who supports liberty, a kind of liberty alliance. People who I have uh, uh, political differences with, small differences and large differences. But those of us who believe in free speech, uh, those of us who believe in freedom of assembly, uh, those of us who believe that the state has no right uh, to medicate us, uh, has no right to uh, require a, a passport of us to show that we've allowed them to medicate us. Those who believe that a thousand flowers should bloom in the intellectual field, we're going to have to come together 
Jonathan, because if we don't, there'll be nothing left for us to argue with each other about. There'll be no liberty or democracy at all. I'm sorry to say. Thanks for the call. Mark is in Minnesota, though. He uh, disagrees with me. That's why he's up next. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, th thank you, George. Uh, I w Welcome. Uh, I, uh, I, I have one request. If I become emotional, uh, please cut me off. Uh, don't do like you did with Paula. Okay. I, I am uh, one of the most hated groups in America. I have to look at my notes here. I'm quite nervous. Uh, to identify myself, I'm a peacenik. And what I object with you is you don't call. What happened? Uh, uh, excuse me, George. We have a time lag here. I'll, uh, I'll listen in just a second, if you will give me some time. Now hurry up, it's the news. So. It, 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 that. I'll tell you what, Mark, why don't you collect your thoughts and we'll call you back uh, because it's uh, the break on the hour uh, that we have to go to now. In the uh, next hour, we'll live to Washington, D.C., to speak to Caleb Mopan, who has a very important conference coming up this weekend. And I'm one of the video guests at that. No doubt we'll get a chance to speak about that too. But he'll be bringing us the news from the front of the United States. Let me take a break. There is no trick other than hard work creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists, like sides of ham, right in the solar plexus. So hard that I literally bent double. Then, after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament, it was war. Every one of his papers, the Daily Mirror, then following the Sunday Mirror, the Sunday People, the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned, all over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. The, the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure, but of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell the monster. You said, what is my secret. I will let you and your viewers know it, what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining it means nothing to me. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Here? Where am I? Welcome to St. Peter's Gate, my son. Is this one of that Hillary's tricks, that devil? Be still, my son. 
The Clintons cannot hurt you here. You are safe with me in heaven. Oh, heck. Knew I shouldn't have taken Bob's homemade vaccine. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I am not worthy. Before you pass on, you may ask any question you desire. Anything? With my omniscient knowledge, I can tell you anything you wish to know. Well, Lord, you got to tell me. All powerful creator of this universe, before you judge me, I've been searching for answers my whole life. Yes, my child. I have to know. Who shot JFK? Ha ah, ah, ha, another one. It was a lone gunman by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. He was not a government agent, and there was no second shooter on that grassy knoll in Dallas. My God. This goes higher up than we thought. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Let's take a call. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. Yeah, I just want to talk about the trans issue that you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, I've got go a ahead. book in front of me by uh, Douglas Murray, and he's got a paragraph here. I'd so just like to read it, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was standing on the corner <laughs> at a quarter. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll get him off, get him off. He's a nutter. He's a nutter. 02077 982 255 is the number if you're in the UK or if you're in the US 001 757 744 4480 or tweet me of course. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. You're watching the mother of all talk shows, Moats Midweek Extra. Sunday service is, of course, unaffected. We're back every Sunday at 7 p.m. But last week and this week, uh, we proved so far, I think, that there is a significant audience for a midweek update on events. I've got so many pieces of social media, I simply don't have time to read them all. Uh, neither can I read the... Uh, poll, but I can tell you that it is achieving record numbers. I've got a computer to read on, but it's gone uh, blank. Uh, so was the U.S. within its rights to have biowarfare labs in Ukraine? Yes, 12%. Who are that 12%? Uh, no, I think the rest, but I can't read the number. Voblat says no. And if anyone wants to question that, think about this. What would the U.S. do if Russia opened a biowarfare lab in Mexico within five minutes of the U.S. border? And Tony Bond says the U.S.-U.K. justified starting a preventative war against Iraq because they claimed it had WMD. By its own logic, the U.S. should not now have WMD in Ukraine. And Gonk says, as if they had biowarfare units. Good, George. You're just making stuff up as you go along. What happened to you, man? You were my hero, but it's all gone a bit loopy. Well, uh, Gonk, uh, you heard, not me, uh, but the, Royal, the U.S. Marine officer, uh, United Nations weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, tell you all about it, probably since you wrote that message or you wouldn't have written such a silly one. Now, uh, Caleb Mopan uh, is a good friend of mine. As I say, he has uh, an important conference. Perhaps he'll tell us something about it coming up uh, this weekend. It's uh, coming up uh, under some pressure of events and, uh, and, of course, the same kind of threats and so on that have made me move out of the London studio uh, to make this uh, show. Uh, but Caleb is a brave man, a believer, and he'll continue. But I wanted to hear from him, not just about his own conference, but about how the war looks now 
uh, that petrol and gas and commodities are now rocketing in price in a United States economy that was already in pretty parlous shape. Caleb, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let's start with uh, that latter point, if we may. According to CNN, uh, many Americans are ready to pay $15 a gallon for a gallon for their gas uh, just to stand up to Russia. Is that your experience so far? Well, that's the experience of perhaps some wealthy members of the middle class. I'm sure that Joe Biden's personal inner circle and many of his millionaire and billionaire backers uh, would feel that way. But average Americans, I don't think so. Average Americans are probably not excited about having to pay so much more for gasoline, especially when they're already having to pay more for food. They're having to pay more for other needed items. I mean, the inflation in the United States is insane. I mean, the price of gasoline at this point has gone up 75 cents uh, already this year. I mean, that is that is a huge rise. And average Americans are being told now by Joe Biden, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. It's all Putin's fault. And we should expect this. This is our duty to stand with Ukraine against those evil Russians. Well, I can guarantee you there are a lot of Americans that are saying, I'm sorry, I've got to feed my family. I'm more concerned about making sure my kids have enough to eat, making sure I can drive to work and drive home from work and drive my kids to school in the morning. Uh, they're more concerned about that than arming the Azov Battalion uh, and, and you know, making sure that uh, the people of Donetsk and Lugansk continue to face a bombardment. Um, and while the U.S. media is doing a lot with, you know, just not just CNN and Fox, but social media is whipping up this anti-Russia hysteria, I think there are a lot of Americans that are looking at their own checkbooks, looking at their own wallet and saying, wait a second, wait a second, who's paying the costs here? Because since the beginning of this pandemic, the richest of the rich have made out like bandits. This has been a great pandemic uh, for Jeff Bezos. This has been a tremendous pandemic for the Walton family that own Walmart. But all through middle America, you have stores closing, small businesses shutting down. Uh, average Americans are very, very worried. We've got this inflation rising. And uh, yeah, Joe Biden now feels he can just scapegoat it all onto Russia. I think a lot of Americans know who's really to blame. Now, uh, one of the ways they won't know, I'm looking uh, on your screen, it says RT America, which no longer exists, and you're out of work. Uh, in the land of the free, how easy a decision was it for the American government to close Sputnik Radio and close RT America? It's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, you know, uh, all employees of RT America, including myself, we received a notice of layoff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I cleared out my desk, uh, the studio in New York City where I work, uh, you know, where I have my office, where I do my lives, it's shut down. And the same in Washington, D.C., and the same in Miami, and the same in Los Angeles. Uh, RT America is no more from what we understand. And that's a lot of Americans, uh, and a lot of whom, you know, had different views. You know, I think that Russia is doing the right thing in Ukraine, as, as difficult as it is. I think they've waited eight years uh, to protect the peoples of Donetsk and Lugansk. And at this point, they're moving in to try and end an eight-year war. But not everyone who worked at RT America felt that way. There was wider variety of perspective on RT America than on any cable network. On RT America, you had conservatives, you had liberals, you had libertarians, you had socialists. You had a wide variety of views, different perspectives, different opinions. They called us propaganda. Propaganda pushes one viewpoint, which is one opinion, one perspective. We were the opposite of propaganda. We were the anti-propaganda. And now, as you see the hysteria being whipped up about Ukraine in the United States, in the universities, on social media, et cetera, you can see why we are absolutely necessary. And my hope is that things can change and that RT America can return. Uh, because we should be allowed to be part of the discourse. You know, there are different views on international events, for goodness sakes. There are two sides of every story. Uh, you know, I mean, could you imagine if they were to only allow, you know, one view of the American Civil War, if we, we, we only got to watch Gone with the Wind and listen to Miss Scarlett say, I do declare, Captain Butler, all oh, these Yankees are coming down here and freeing our slaves. It's awful. Imagine if there was only one perspective on the American Civil War. We would never stand for that. And there should be more than one perspective on the situation in Ukraine. But now in American media, they are not only trying to uh, make sure that other perspectives aren't heard, they're actively shutting it down. 
my personal Twitter account, which has nothing to do with Russia, no one in Russia tells me what to tweet, no one in Russia has anything to do with my Twitter, has been labeled by Twitter as Russian state affiliate media. I'm from Ohio. I don't speak a word of Russian. Nobody from my family is Russian. I'm an Irish American. I, I have a right to have my views. I am not a Russian state affiliated media. Uh, that, that is ridiculous. And this has been done to other journalists. Rachel Blevins has been tagged. Manila Chan of RT America has been tagged. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous cancel culture censorship. We have the right to put our perspectives out there. You know, Just because we, we work at, at a Russian company doesn't mean we're not human beings, doesn't mean we don't have our own views. That's ridiculous. Well, you say you have a right, but it turns out you don't have a right. Uh, this is what we're discovering, isn't it? That all the rights and liberties that we thought we had, some of us were skeptical, but we still in our hearts hoped we had, uh, and some of which in your country were guaranteed in a constitution, in, in a bill of rights. Uh, it turns out that we don't have the owners of uh, the public square, are not the public, uh, but uh, high big tech uh, billionaires. Sure. Silicon Valley and the amount of power concentrated in their hands, George, is astronomical. Uh, they have the ability to sway elections. They have the ability to influence all kinds of things with their algorithms. You want to talk about an exponential amount of power. And it's also important to remember that Silicon Valley, you know, the tech giants, they weren't created synthetically. They didn't just come out of nowhere. We're constantly fed this story that there were a bunch of nerds who were tinkering around in their garages and they invented, they invented computers and that's how great the free market is, blah, blah, blah. That's not what happened. There was a strategic decision made by U.S. intelligence agencies during the late 1970s and 80s during the Cold War. Uh, they started pouring government money in there. It's the National Security Agency of the United States, the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. There's the ones that created Silicon Valley. They knew that even though the Soviet Union was very advanced in their computer technology, they didn't have the same level of funding that, they, that, 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 that we have in the United States. And it was the intelligence agencies that made the United States the center of the computer revolution and really created Silicon Valley. That's why, you know, you'll remember Al Gore, why the act was saying, I invented the internet. Well, what he meant was that a strategic decision was made by U.S. intelligence and the U.S. military to move ahead with creating what is now Silicon Valley. And yes, it enables them to manipulate world events. Look at what happened during the Arab Spring. We now know that Hillary Clinton had in her State Department Jared Andrew Cohen, who was on the board of Google Alphabet, and he was working to make sure that Twitter and Facebook and other social media outlets were moving in a certain way that was strategic for the United States and damaging toward Iran during the Arab Spring. This is a fact, you can look at this, that Silicon Valley and the US State Department manipulated the Arab Spring to hurt Iran and to benefit US foreign policy. That's a fact. Um, and so we know that Silicon Valley is very much a tool of the forces that want to dominate the world for big corporations and banks based in Wall Street and London. That is a fact. Uh, but the reality is, once this technology gets invented, it doesn't get uninvented. And eventually, there are going to be alternatives to the U.S. social media giants like Facebook and Twitter that are based in different parts of the world. That's why they're so terrified of TikTok. TikTok has bent over backwards not to cooperate with, with the Chinese government, not to be available on the Chinese mainland. They're still terrified of it because they know what it represents. Think back to feudalism, right? At the time of feudalism, you know, the, the Bibles, uh, you know, was, was printed in the printing press. The printing presses were all controlled by the Catholic Church. Uh, but pretty soon, critics of the Catholic Church started printing their own Bibles and started having their own ability to use the printing press for their information. And that's the way it works with modern information technology. Sure, modern social media may be dominated by Wall Street and the tech monopolies, but pretty soon alternative forces uh, that are, are pushing back against them are going to have the ability to utilize social media. And they're going to have their own social media outlets. And this monopoly that the tech giants hold on to and cling to, the tighter they, they tighten their grip, the more censorship they put on it, it only expedites. It's only a matter of time before pretty soon they will lose their monopoly and there will be free speech alternatives to Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And they know this. It's only a matter of time before they lose their monopoly on information. And they're scrambling to do damage control right now. 
Now, uh, as we both uh, agree, this is a quite unprecedented uh, blizzard uh, of propaganda and censorship that uh, we're going through. It's all the more uh, uh, unusual in that our countries are not actually involved in this war uh, on the face of it. Uh, I had far more freedom uh, to speak uh, during the Iraq war, for example, uh, when my own country was actually in the war, uh, than I do now uh, in a war that we are not, on the face of it, participating in. Uh, and also, there are other differences. In the Iraq war, we had a vast anti-war movement. Now we don't. And that vast anti-war movement had a left, and its left was clear about the main issues involved in the, in the conflict, in the run-up to and during the conflict. That's no longer true either. As a matter of fact, many of the left, as they define themselves, are supporting NATO. They're sporting the twibbons. Uh, they are echoing the tropes uh, of uh, the NATO uh, propagandists, at least here in Britain. How is it in the US? Well, look, I think that we have to remember that Joe Biden and his administration contains a lot of followers of Zbigniew Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the strategist of the late Cold War. He served as national security advisor in the Carter administration. And what they are very good at doing is turning things around, presenting the United States as if it's not the aggressor and making other countries look like they are the aggressor. And that creates a situation where a lot of people on the left, they sympathize with people who are victimized. We sympathize with workers on the job who are victimized by their employers. Uh, we sympathize with the countries around the world that the USA victimizes with its drones and its tanks and its bombs. And so reinventing the message where somehow Ukraine is the victim and Russia is the aggressor, uh, it is a, a weird psychological operation. And this is what Jimmy Carter did with the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. And we now know they called it the Afghan trap. They created a situation where the Soviet leaders felt they had to intervene in Afghanistan. And then they cranked up the propaganda. Those Afghans are being attacked by the evil Soviet Union. Uh, they made a James Bond movie where the Mujahideen of Afghanistan were the heroes fighting the Soviets. And they, they tried to reverse the narrative uh, to appeal to the part of us, many of us who are on the left, I consider myself a leftist, Many of us who are on the left, we want to sympathize with the downtrodden and with, and with the oppressed, right? And so they, they flip the script, and it's a very effective strategy. But what people need to remember is that Ukraine is not an independent country. Starting in 2014, when the USA toppled the government of Ukraine, it stopped being independent. Uh, it became a colony of the United States, and the United States is there. Uh, the EU countries are there. There's a whole network of advisors. And Zelensky doesn't really run Ukraine. He came into office promising that he would bring the country back together. He would de-escalate conflict. He hasn't been able to do that because he's not really in power. Ukraine is just an outpost of American imperialism. And the people in the eastern regions, in Donetsk and Lugansk, who've been facing bombing and shelling for eight years, 14,000 of them are dead, they're victims, and no one ever talks about them. On CNN, they don't exist. They just don't exist in American media. But for eight years, they have faced bombing and shelling and drone strikes and a food blockade from the United States. They have been victimized. And Russia has said, reintegrate them back into Ukraine. We don't want to recognize their independent republics. Implement the Minsk Accords, reintegrate them back into Ukraine. And it's been eight years. And finally, with the Minsk Accords not being signed and not being carried out, they have been signed, but they haven't been carried out. At this point, Russia is recognizing them, and it is stepping in uh, to offer them protection and beat back the Ukrainian military that the United States has been arming. Look, one part of this conflict that nobody in the United States is talking about that must be touched on is this. Uh, in the United States, could you imagine if there was some judge or some, some governor in some state who said, you know, I, I, I think English is the language of the United States, so if somebody speaks Spanish, if a Latino or a Chicano in the United States speaks Spanish, we're gonna write them a ticket and we're gonna drag them into court and we're gonna fine them for speaking their own language. If that happened in the United States, we would never stand for that. We would call that racism, we would call it out, we would oppose it. That's what the Ukrainian government has been doing to Russian speaking peoples within their own borders for the past eight years, dragging them to court, punishing them 
for speaking their own language. And they have declared independence, they have broken away, and Russia has said, no, we'd like Ukraine to just recognize you, give you autonomy, reintegrate you in, back into Ukrainian society. We have a treaty, the Minsk Accords, that says that that's what's supposed to happen, but the Ukrainian government hasn't done it. Instead, it's been bombing and shelling these people. It's subjected them to a food blockade. It's locked people in prison for their social media posts. It's shut down TV channels. And finally, after eight years, Russia says, okay, we have to move in and protect these people. You can't start ki keep killing Russian-speaking people on our border. We're going to move in and protect them. Russia is not the aggressor here. Uh, the United States toppled the Ukrainian government. The United States has poured all kinds of lethal weapons into Ukraine. And that's what people need to understand. But it's by flipping the script and following that big new Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter strategy, that's how they've been able to kind of maneuver and manipulate a lot of left-wing forces. And that's what we need to understand about what's going on right now. Now, you'll presumably be dealing with the current crisis in your important political conference coming up this weekend. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Some great folks are going to be there. Jackson Hinkle is going to be there. Uh, you know, Samira Khan is going to be there. We're going to hear from uh, Haas of the infrared community. We're going to hear from Peter Coffin. I'm going to be there. Um, we're going to have speakers. We're going to talk about their recent trip to Nicaragua. Uh, we're going to talk about what's really going on in Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, we're going to have messages from a lot of different forces around the world, including yourself. I'm very excited to hear what your remarks to our conference will be. Um, and many people are coming in from around the country. But we anticipate protests outside. We have spent a lot of money on security because we anticipate a lot of people are going to want to shut this down. But, you know, when I think about this, I think about how during the Cold War, uh, back in 1949, the great Albert Einstein spoke at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in 1949 at the Peace Conference, along with Shostakovich and Lillian Hellman, against the danger of nuclear war in 1949 amid the McCarthyite witch hunts and how they convened that great peace conference in New York City to stand up against the danger of nuclear war, to tell the truth about what was really going on in Europe. And at the time, NATO was being formed, what it was really being formed for. So I take inspiration from the past. There's a long history of Americans, Americans like Eugene Debs, uh, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others, standing up against the war drive and the propaganda of the U.S. government. So I would say that, you know, I am, I am a patriotic American. I love my country. And that is why I don't want people from Ohio or Pennsylvania or Texas or Alabama to go get sent to Ukraine to go and get shot for Joe Biden or for the Azov Battalion. And to really love America, you have to stand against the dangerous escalation with Russia because it's bad for America. It's bad for American working families. It's bad for our communities. It's bad for the world. It's hurting everyone. It doesn't benefit anyone but the Wall Street oil banking elites, uh, the Pentagon weapons contractors. It doesn't benefit the working people of the world from the United States or any other country in the world. And, and I have a patriotic duty to stand against this war. And we are going to convene a very important conference. A lot of people are opposing us, but that means we're doing our job. You know, uh, if people aren't calling us out or people aren't, aren't reacting to us, it would mean no one's hearing us. So the fact that we're getting getting so much uh, uh, so many threats, I guess you could say, uh, is a it shows that we are saying what needs to be said in an atmosphere where our message is largely being unheard and needs to be heard desperately. How can people follow it, Caleb? Are you going to live stream it? Our uh, video will be up afterwards. It's March 12th, Saturday. It'll be in Austin, Texas. It, it'll be at the South Park Hotel. Uh, uh, doors open at one o'clock. Video will be on the web afterwards. Uh, we welcome anyone, anyone to come. Uh, you know, um, you know, we're not going to obviously allow any disruption. There'll be a lot of security. Be prepared to go through a metal detector. Uh, be prepared to show some ID at the door. But other than that, uh, you're welcome to come. And we would like people to be there, uh, people from all walks of life, ask good questions. There'll be some good music as well, some, uh, some classic American Woody Guthrie folk music. Uh, classical pianist is going to perform. It's going to be a great afternoon. So I hope people will come out. Just make sure the classical pianist doesn't play Tchaikovsky, because that appears to be off the agenda here in Britain, at least. I wish I could be there in person. I will be there uh, on screen. Caleb Mopan, as always, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Much obliged to you. Now, what's coming up next? How's the poll doing? Was the U.S. within its rights? Yes, 12%. No, 88%. Although on YouTube, it's yes, 5%. No, 95%. On Telegram, yes, 3%. 
no 97%. How come the smartest people are always on the Telegram channel? Uh, David in Birmingham says, I'm a bit older than you, George. Absolutely, I've never lived through such intense insanity with the Ukraine-Russia conflict. It's true, actually, David. Social media has magnified the matter. The dumbed-down British public has been sucked in big time. Perfectly put. And Andy says the anti-Russian xenophobia is out of hand now. Banning Russian cats, I'd forgotten about that. Pouring Smirnoff, British-owned, down the drain. Banning disabled athletes from competing because they are Russian. Where will it stop? Kristallnacht too on Russians? God forbid, but uh, I'd forgotten about the cats. I'd forgotten about Anastasia. It's been bumped off uh, off the, the Disney uh, channel. Can you believe that? Now, have I got a call? It's a rose. It's a rose in Texas. Go ahead, Rose. Hello. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, it seems to me that this geopolitical development recently has unmasked a lot of the like sinister underbelly of the supposedly anti-war left in Western Europe and the U.S. When you have so many I leftists kind of advocating... That, yeah. Yeah, when you have so many leftists, or at least self-proclaimed leftists, advocating for no-fly zones and further NATO aggression and conflict that NATO itself is already responsible for, and on the other hand, you have Tucker Carlson and Ron Paul who have both made clear that they are against, or at least currently, for, yeah. against further escalation of the conflict from NATO and the Biden administration in particular, for me it raises the question of whether or not a new like, international political realignment is happening based on multipolarity as opposed to U.S. hegemony in foreign policy, and then that also raises the question of what that realignment could mean if it's happening for independent voters in upcoming elections, uh, both in the U.K. and the U.S. So I know there are already some uh, left-leaning independents, uh, but there's like Kim Iverson, who have said they'll be likely be voting Republican in the midterms to oppose like vaccine yeah. mandates, and many more independent channels I follow, such as like Revolutionary Blackout Network, have made their position unequivocally clear to not vote for either the Democratic or Republican parties in any upcoming elections on the principle of anti-imperialism alone. Do you think the current discourse on these events could potentially be laying the ideological groundwork for a kind of populist coalition around anti-war and anti-censorship policies in general? Or is the divide too great on other issues, such as cultural issues, for such a coalition like that to form? What do you think? Well, it might be, uh, but it might be that we don't really have a choice uh, because if we are uh, increasingly suppressed and banned and struck off, denied platforms and so on, there'll be nothing left to argue about culturally or uh, on uh, other political issues. So I kind I of favor this idea of uh, a, a liberty alliance. Somebody wrote to me about it. Just yesterday, they're, they're setting up a, a Liberty Alliance uh, Twitter account. I don't know what it is, uh, but uh, I will share it when it comes because I think that, that the when I'm trying to analyze this, Rose, I'm wondering why this unprecedented sweep of war psychosis has occurred, especially in mm -hmm. countries that aren't even in the war. And I'm... Yeah. I'm connecting it to the whole COVID thing now. I didn't want to. I resisted it. I'm connecting it to the psychosis, the mass psychology, uh, the Pavlovian operation around the mm -hmm. COVID thing. It's like, it's like you know, no, Ukraine, is the new, Ukraine is the new COVID. <laughs> the Russians are the new anti-vaxxers. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me to have uh, a connection. They're the new truckers. In. Yeah, the new truckers uh, seems to me to be connected. So if I'm right about that, and I'm still thinking it through, uh, and I'm no philosopher, let me make that clear. Uh, I, I'm thinking, well, maybe those of us uh, that uh, are against censorship for free speech, for free expression, for bodily autonomy, uh, uh, want to put our own countries first, America first. Uh, and Germany first, and France first, and so on, uh, maybe uh, we need to somehow get together, even, even if it's just on a Twitter feed, uh, if not in electoral terms. But if I was voting 
in, uh, in the United States of America. I wouldn't vote for a Democrat that is gung-ho for war. I'd rather mm -hmm. vote for somebody that was hostile to the war, even if I disagreed with them on all kinds of things, like Donald Trump. Last word to yeah. you, mate. Well, I'm, I'm genuinely ashamed to confess that I did vote for Biden in 2020, and genuinely ashamed. And I live in a town in Texas, which is also known as Bomb City, because we have a lot of nuclear weapons over here, which we're allegedly in the process of dismantling. So what I'm thinking right now, as I'm seeing Biden and NATO escalate this conflict further and further, is that I, am, I may have mo voted for my own death in a nuclear war. So I'm very grateful to you and everyone else fighting back against the propaganda on this, because I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew that the Democratic, I always knew the Democratic Party was bad, so I always considered it a lesser of two evil votes. But it, it just seems like it's the greater of two evils now, and so I can understand why well, yeah, uh, that's, certain family uh, even members if of mine are, agree, are considering voting the other party now. But you know, <laughs> even, even if we could agree which was the lesser of two evils, which is increasingly difficult, uh, right? You're still letting evil win <laughs> by exactly. voting uh, for them. Uh, look, listen. Thanks mm -hmm. for the call. I need to take yeah, a short you. break, and then it's calls. I think all the way to the hour. I'll be right back. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, uh, I've got so much social media, I won't get through it all, but I promise I will read it all. Uh, I was, uh, my eye was caught by Ray Jones, who says George Galloway, perhaps, uh, as the next leader of the Conservative Party. I assume he means that as an insult. But in any case, I'm already spoken for. I'm the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. Check them out. And Marty says George sounding like Farage at the moment. You see, you are typical, uh, Marty, of the cowards that I referred to earlier. Instead of writing that kind of thing, why not call me? If you're in Britain, 0808196552, or are you a gutless coward, a keyboard warrior? If you're not a gutless coward, pick up the phone now, 0808196552. Go on, I dare you. The thing I want to talk to you about is the the fact that you uh, you you stated at the top of the show that it was um, most likely uh, dinghy refugees that had bombed Liverpool. Today. I said nothing of the kind. You, you really? Did, actually, I said nothing of the kind. I Neither you nor you I. I said nothing. Stop! 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 Fair, stop! I said nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. Now, if you want to carry on, carry on. But I said nothing of the kind. You need to listen to it again. I, I have listened to it two or three times because I was so bloody angry at the first one. I have thought I'd better listen tell to me that then. again. Tell me what I, I said. Tell, tell, tell me, uh, tell me I what I said. That you're after the, the Tory vote, the ex-Tory vote. Um, I appreciate How that. How dare you? How dare um, you? Get I, this woman, get this that, woman uh, off the line. I'll tell you what I am desperate about, madam. I am desperately angry that pregnant women, new mothers in a Liverpool hospital were almost torn to pieces by terrorist explosions. That's what I'm desperate about. I'm not interested in former Tory vote. Why don't you get this foolish paradigm out of your mind? The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The world is our classroom and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, Kia Ora asks from New Zealand, and several people have asked, can anyone explain how Mr. Zelensky, who a few days ago was in hiding with his people in Ukraine, managed to turn up at the British Parliament yesterday? As a matter of fact, he wasn't in the British Parliament. 
it was a televised address to a group of SEALs who clapped on cue to his sub churchillian rhetoric. Now, the poll is going great guns. 5,320 people have uh, voted. So keep, uh, keep on voting on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube, on my Telegram channel. But it's calls as much as we can tonight. Uh, here's Ray in Swansea, who disagrees with me. That's why he's up next. Go ahead, Ray. Hello there, George. Um, Hi there. Go ahead, yeah, sir. Especially when you talk about these NBC labs or these uh, that have been found in Ukraine, don't you think yeah. it's a bit, that's more likely to be Russian propaganda to sort of justify well, their excuse of just walking into Ukraine? And I understand well, what I you're saying. Have, about uh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, yeah, okay. hold on, hold on. I'll let, I'll let you okay. back. I would have been more inclined to think that if it hadn't been confirmed by Victoria Newland, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, in front of the U.S. Senate just yesterday. Go on. But what do you think they're going to be weaponizing things like the bubonic plague? Well, you just heard uh, you just heard Scott Ritter, who knows a bit more about these things than you or me, for that matter about uh, how easy it is to weaponize that which you are innocently working on in a, a bio-weapons uh, lab. Go on, Ray. But that wasn't that what was sort of said about Wuhan? Because I didn't sort of fall for that sort of, like, um, line as well when it came to COVID-19, that that fell out of, like, a Chinese mm -hmm. sort of, like, mm -hmm. NBC lab. So it's just kind of the same kind of stuff. And well, did you feel you that way about, about the Iraqi uh, weapons of mass destruction, Canard? The problem with that is, is that I was in the RAF at the time when that kicked off. Oh. I just started my career in 2001. And mm. when you're in that position, you just have to kind of do as you're told. So obviously I kind of fell for the mainstream media at the time because obviously they wanted to try and justify like the Twin Towers. And then there was like a propaganda campaign to sort of like suggest, well, we all need to go in here because obviously the government needed the public support to obviously back itself when going into there. Um, but ultimately... And do, you regret, do, you, do you regret that now, Ray? I think it went on for far too long. I think it, we no, were right do you, re do, do, you regret, do you regret attacking Iraq for no. weapons of mass destruction that it didn't have? No, I still think we were right to go in there. OK, Overall. thanks very much. Thanks very much for the call. Uh, the numbers are there on the screen. Uh, you can uh, call me, you can tweet me, and you can uh, also, of course, email me. Let me get some more social media because uh, we've got uh, so much of it. Andy says, uh, no, we've done that one. Terry in Toronto says, this is not only censorship, but thought control. I'm glad there are people like you around, people that refuse to toe the official line and bow down and kiss the feet of the politicians. Thank you, Terry. If you had a crystal ball, asks a fellow Scotsman in New Zealand, if only I did, uh, how is the world going to look in two years, five years, and 10 years' time in your eyes? I'll tell you what, Jock, I'm more concerned that it might not be able to look at at all. Here's the numbers. Uh, in the United Kingdom, 08081 965522. And in the United States, plus one, 844 944 Sorry uh, if it's not quite as smooth as usual. As I said, I'm broadcasting underground uh, from now on. And uh, where are we? Galileo says, if the Ukrainian government allowed these labs and it wasn't against existing treaties, sure. There's one problem, though. The Ukrainian government does not exist since 2014. That's a point made by Caleb Mopen a, a minute or two ago. Fabio Ribeiro says, after poisoning America's rivers, lakes, soils and beaches, Americans think they can turn all countries into poisoned sewers. Someone will have to imprison these individuals with brains in a pigsty. Mohammed al-Sharafi says no, and was the Soviet Union within its rights to have missiles in Cuba in the 1960s? Everyone has the rights to defend their national security. Uh, Nadar is in Chicago on the subject of oil. 
And Gas, go ahead, Nadar. George, I cannot express how honor and privilege to talk to a gentleman like you. I wish you, all sir. the politicians were like you, who has a brain and use it, instead of just being you, puppets. Sir. You're more than welcome, sir. And thanks for taking my call. My question welcome. is, it's, in, it's uh, three parts, but I'll try to do it real fast because I know you're very busy. And, uh, a lot of people want to call. Number one, yeah. what do you think of the U.S. sending very high delegate people from the White House to Venezuela and, and their tail between their legs? Number two, if you were in the shoes of the Venezuela president, what would you do? And number three, I don't understand Mr. Putin. He has the pipes open to Europe with oil and gas, with all the punishments that they're throwing on him. Why didn't he just close the pipes? Let the people rise against these corrupted politicians and get it over with. What do you think? Your, well, your in opinion in, is very... In, in, uh, yeah, in reverse order, Nadar, uh, I think Russia has now uh, closed the remaining pipeline. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is closed. Uh, but the pipeline down which uh, 40% of Europe's Russian gas came through has now been uh, stopped. I think Russia is cutting off the gas. And the price, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, will exponentially rise and then be unavailable at all uh, with extraordinary uh, knock-on conditions for all of us, not just in heating and then in the summer in cooling, uh, but in uh, industrial and in transportation, uh, everything will grind to a halt. Uh, the government will try to blame that on Russia. Fair enough. Uh, blame but, uh, blame the, nobody but, but the themselves. Voters, yeah, but the, yeah, but the voters don't have the chance to vote against uh, the Russians. They do have the chance to vote against their own leaders, and I suspect that they will uh, take it. On the Venezuelan point, uh, I was actually going to deal with that in my opening remarks, but I went on way too long, so I couldn't. Uh, it is an extraordinary development that the United States that put a multi-million dollar bounty on the head of President Nicolas Maduro, that paid mercenaries to invade his country, to try and murder him, uh, that has maintained a raft, a, a blockade effectively, an embargo. Everything you could think on, of that the U.S. Uh, is good at. Yeah, uh, everything that they are good at, they've done to Venezuela. They have caused mass deaths in Venezuela. And hunger, uh, by exactly. their Hunger, uh, shortage of medicines. Uh, they have attempted to mass murder the Venezuelan people. And they appointed a puppet president called Juan Guaido <laughs> and gave him is billions of dollars belonging to the Venezuelan people. And now they're in Caracas begging Maduro and the Venezuelan government to step up their oil production for it, America's it's benefit. It is exactly. a what very about... bad joke. And I'm sure you asked me what I thought Maduro would exactly. do. I knew Maduro. I knew Maduro when he was a bus driver, before he and was you know what? a vice I respect. Pastor. I respect your opinion because your opinion, I think of, I think of it very highly, and I appreciate it. If you go ahead and continue, and I appreciate you answering me. Go ahead. God bless. God bless you, Nader, in Chicago. Vaz is in Devon. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Vaz. Hello, George. It's a Hello, it's sir. A, go ahead. It's an honor to speak with you again. Thank I you, brother. So many questions for you. I don't even know where to start. We've had this, <laughs> exactly. We've had, this, yeah, we've had this situation with, um, oh, what's her name, who admitted, uh, you have to forgive me because I found that as this has gone on, the only thing that helps me get through the day is um, Jack Daniels. I would like to drink vodka, but it's been banned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I advise you not to drink anything myself, but go on. I, I know you like to you like to abstain, but unfortunately, the poor people like myself 
have to find a way to get through the day without worrying about whether they're going to be bombed by nuclear or biological weapons. So, the Americans, this, this, uh, what's her name, Victoria, what, what was she? Victoria she Newland. Victoria Newland. Yeah, she, admit, she admitted to Congress that um, the Ukraine had 37 separate biological facilities within the Ukraine that were backed and funded by the United States of America. Now, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't that go completely against international convention? Well, it would depend what they were doing there, and it depends if you believe uh, Ray, our former RAF man that still believes it was right to invade and occupy Iraq, even though a million people were dead, which puts into perspective his feelings about the uh, hundreds now of uh, Ukrainian civilians that are dead. He still thinks it was right to kill a million Iraqis. That's why I hurried him off the air, because I wouldn't have been able to control myself if I had started on him, and I didn't want to do that. It would be degrading for everyone. So uh, the answer is, if you believe Scott Ritter, a former I, United Nations arms no, I, inspector, no, no, uh, then no, 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 no. Uh, I, and I believe him, uh, then I, uh, these uh, weapons labs uh, could quickly be turned, and maybe already were turned, to offensive military uh, capability. Last word to yes, you, Buzz. Yeah, but the yeah, but the Americans like they 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 spoke about this like literally today, yesterday, in order to preempt the possibility that these weapons, if they were used, would end up being the responsibility of the Russians. But the Russians, Putin, right, did not instigate the 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 instigation of these laboratories within the Ukraine. This was done by, obviously, the CIA and the American USA deep state. So Yes, without, put... without, look, uh, Vaz, without a doubt at all, uh, that's what they were doing. It was damage control. But the really interesting thing is, and I say this to other fools that are watching uh, who've fallen for propaganda, when I announced this on Sunday, it was immediately denounced online and in print and on the mainstream media as a lie, as Russian propaganda, only 24 hours later to be confirmed by the United States Senate itself and Victoria Newland herself. And so it was canceled my last announcement. It's not a lie. It's not Russian propaganda. It's true. And we're worried that Russia will get uh, their hands on them. Vaz, thanks for the call. Chris is in Hong Kong. Better not keep Chris waiting any longer. He's in China. Go ahead, Chris, in Hong Kong. Yeah, George, of course I'm in the People's Republic of China. Been going for 25 yes. years, mate. Uh, how are you this wow. evening? Talking about propaganda... Uh, do you remember that little case in uh, Kuwait with the uh, um, babies being thrown out of uh, incubators? Yeah, Nayala. Uh, I think yeah. her name was Nayala. She was a nurse, don't you know? But she I... was helpfully dubbed up so you couldn't see her face because she was a very pious <laughs> nurse. Uh, although that was actually to conceal the fact that she was not a nurse. She was the daughter of the Saudi ambassador to the United States. Yes, they were rather strange. Sorry, the, the, However, Kuwaiti, uh, the Kuwaiti uh, ambassador. Go ahead. It was the Kuwaiti ambassador. Actually, yeah. Um, yeah. of course, there's been a, a large amount happening in uh, Maripol uh, today. Uh, of course, well, we've got a, a bunch of neo-Nazis uh, that have embedded themselves within the uh, civilian population, probably around the hospital, by what I can discern at the moment. I think what was more shocking... Um, and a story taken up by the Telegraph about four or five hours ago was that the foreign minister of um, Ukraine, uh, Kaluba, 
uh, has claimed that there are 3,000 newborn babies stuck in the city of Maripol. That's a lot of babies in Mariupol. I know. So I I did the stats a bit quick on that, and uh, I could understand if it was 3,000 infants under the age of nine months, that would be a correct figure. He's actually stated 3,000 newborn babies, which would basically be 50% of the females pregnant in all of Ukraine descended upon one little area with neo Nazis in it. <laughs> you work it out. The actual yeah, well, it, it's just, uh, well it's just below, uh, propaganda for well sure. But uh, the, what, what appears to have happened in the hospital is uh, an unmitigated uh, tragedy. And I know that the Nazis have embedded themselves in and around uh, these kind of areas. Isn't that what the Israelis always say when they uh, bring down death and destruction on civilian areas, that the terrorists were hiding there? Uh, The same people that defend that uh, in the Western media are not prepared to accept it as an explanation for this. Um, I myself uh, deplore it. If, uh, If Russian fire landed in a maternity hospital and killed women and children. It is an absolutely heinous act. It will not have been intentional, I'm sure, but it is a heinous act. And uh, and I'm not a hypocrite. I say it's a heinous act when it happens in Gaza. I've got to say it's a heinous act if it happens in Mariupol. Uh, it's about time that Mariupol was liberated from the Azov uh, and other far-right battalions that are holding the people hostage there. It's high time that it happens. The sooner the better, George. The sooner the better, George. However, if an attack has taken place, I do hope the Russian Federation will investigate and prosecute if necessary. If there was uh, negligence, uh, for sure, they should. Indeed. Chris, thanks for the call. Standard you're in truth. China. All right, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome, mate. You're, 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 you're in China. I'm going to Japan next. It's Ash in Japan. Go ahead, Ash. Yeah, hi, George. I'm a first-time caller. Um, I found your channel through Jackson Hinkle. I usually Wonderful. watch uh, He's a great, a great Jimmy man, Dore. A great and, man. Yeah, it's a very adorable kid. Um. Well, I'm kind of apprehensive. Um, I have a few questions. My first question is, well, the fact that, well, I, I, I have an American accent because I grew up in America. I have no ill will or ill feelings to America, but I'm just kind of scared that they can always arm the most violent people. Like when they were going into, like whenever they do the proxy wars, they always arm the most violent people. And now they're arming Nazis. And the idea that it can be so casual for them to do it, I, I'm just shocked and asking, why do they always try to arm these most extreme people? It's a nihilistic desire to destroy uh, that which they cannot control. They wish to destroy. Uh, there's a belief sometimes uh, that, uh, that they can control the Frankenstein monsters that they create. They obviously didn't read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein right to the end because these monsters become monsters because you cannot control them. Uh, And we've created, I could go back a long way uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in the early 1950s against uh, President Nasser. I could go through uh, a whole range of Islamist fanatic organizations in different places. Uh, that the United States has set up and funded and financed. I could, uh, of course, take you uh, to Afghanistan uh, and all the Stinger missiles that they gave out there uh, ended up being fired against us, against our uh, service personnel. Uh, it uh, It is a tried, tested, and failed formula, but they never seem to get out of the habit of doing it. I mean, and the thing about now, they're giving out weapons in mass to Ukraine. I, I feel like 
um, of course, it's, it's meant to prolong this longer, but of course, with human suffering there, are we, re are we really being ruled by psychopaths? I, I mean, to the point where I feel that inhuman at this point, they, they play with people's lives like they're nothing. Is there really yeah. like to a, a breaking point where I a certain amount the, of money th means you have no conscience? <laughs> What's going on? I, I think psychopaths is the right word for them. Uh, I think that uh, some of them are fools only. I think Joe Biden has completely lost it. I don't believe that he is making the decisions in Washington nowadays. I think some of them are well, but, but, uh, just fools, but the others well, are psychopaths. Maybe, sorry, Lindsey Graham is there saying that he wants to assassinate Russia. I mean, how do you, how do you get, uh, get on TV and say you want to assassinate another world leader? I mean, it's so, it's so, it's, I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like I'm going, I'm the one crazy because the world. No, you're not. No, no, you're not. So you're crazy. not. The, the, a, mil, a million people will uh, watch this show tonight. A million did on Sunday and a million Wednesday before that. So you're definitely not the one that's crazy. Most people uh, that are here uh, on this uh, audience, in this audience, are uh, not at all crazy. Sometimes they feel like they must be. And therefore, coming together in a show like this is extremely valuable to them. In term, it's almost like a kind of therapy we're all experiencing. When I listen to Caleb Mopen, for example, uh, talking, it's a great encouragement to me uh, that uh, the way I'm seeing things is the correct way, uh, and that there are millions of us who feel this way. It's very important, Ash, and that you are in Japan also thinking that same way. It's very important that we hear you and that you hear us and that we metaphorically uh, join hands uh, across the oceans. God bless you and yours in Japan. Uh, let's take a break. Coming up in the third hour, it's the one and only Barry Silkman, ex-Manchester City. How are they getting on tonight, by the way? Uh, he's on the show talking about sports and censorship and about the upcoming football podcast that he'll be doing with me, yours truly. I'll be back after the break. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Time, weather, and... Let's play a game, and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay, then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Listen! Watch and share the fastest growing political program in the world! Yo, Mikey, what's happening? Joey! The usual? Sure. You looking fresh, man. You get a new haircut? Nah, brother. I just got that, you know, scholarship from the College of Knowledge. Oh, you got into the University of the Airwaves? Sure did, brother. I got knowledge coming out of my ears. GG, man, he knows what's up. I knew there was something new about you. Yo, reckon he take me? Everyone is welcome, brother. Even from Jersey. <laughs> Ignition, lift off, lift off, 30 minutes after the hour. We need to uh, acclimatize the public uh, for the introduction of extraterrestrials because, come to the conclusion at this point, if they're going to come, they are going to come soon. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, they actually saw the saucer land in front of them or pass by in New York or go overhead. It went in front of my eyes up and turned into a, what looked like a star way up in the sky. 
they said the same line that you just made, and it was amazing. It is an awful waste of space if if we are all if that there is. All that there is. Exactly. Have you ever seen any of these phenomena? I have seen um, energy entities. One looked like a massive jellyfish. The other one looked like a massive centipede. <laughs> Well, you had me up to that point. Now I just think you're stark raving mad. Our world is full of mysteries. The lost city of Atlantis. Area 51. Who killed JFK? It's a conspiracy, man. We have a right to know. Shut it, you nutter. The senseless made sensible only on the mother of all talk shows. Global Higher Education with one of the world's best known iconoclasts. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news, and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh, my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that, at least. You've got to let down your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Downing Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before. It was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history, and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. of the airwaves with George Galloway. Well, uh, that uh, Liverpool show is, of course, sold out. It was sold out a month, uh, a month before the actual date. Uh, so you can't get tickets for that anymore, but I will be in Liverpool. Uh, um, and I'm looking forward very much to it. Uh, I'll introduce the film and then I'll take questions on it. Uh, it is important that we know the lengths to which our state will go. And as I've said before, I never go for walks in the woods. And as the Lord hath set his cannon against self-slaughter, I'll never commit suicide. Just remember that, in case I'm found having committed suicide in the woods. But the event in Oxford is still selling. Now that's in uh, April. It's in Oxford Town Hall, 25th of April, a long way off. But Better make sure you get your tickets now. Ticketsource.co.uk forward slash Killing Kelly. Uh, you can uh, get your tickets there. I'll be there, and I hope to meet with you uh, there. Now, Barry Silkman, a very good friend of mine, is a former professional football player of note and a very successful football agent. He's not my agent, but I'm hoping to engage him for my three fine young sons who are all making their way in the game. But 
He's not here to talk about either of those things tonight. We are living in a period where politics is being dragged into football, often by the very people that told us that politics shouldn't be dragged into football. Barry knows who I mean. Thanks for joining us, Barry Silkman. I'm very glad to see you hale and hearty. Uh, I hope your uh, arm has recovered. You had an arm injury. Um, I'm very glad to see you. We'll not ask you to show us your scars. But let me start with Roman Abramovich. Just exactly what did Abramovich do wrong in Britain beyond making Chelsea a power in world football, for which I'll never forgive him? <laughs> Evening, George, everyone. <laughs> um, I was hoping you could tell me, George, because I haven't got a clue. I, other than being being Russian, um, I've got no idea. I mean, what it's got to do with sport, I don't know. I suppose sport now, as we spoke about before, is now a business. So he doesn't come under a sport anymore. He comes under a business. What he's done wrong? Well, your guess is as good as mine, George. I have no idea. No, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of Chelsea, as I've just made clear. And I'm even less of a fan of Roman Abramovich. But I'm asking myself, I've asked you, and you don't know, and I don't know, and we're two pretty savvy guys. Just exactly what did Abramovich do to get witch hunted out of the game, out of the club that he's spent billions on building, uh, not just building on the park, building in the academy, building in the locality, uh, and now he's no more. They're going to have to find... It's a fire sale, Barry. They're going to find some other... Uh, dodgy character to down an alley. I don't know uh, what's his name. Uh, only fools and horses. Uh, <laughs> you know the trotter, trotters, independent. Uh, we're looking for. I think we're looking for Del, Del Boy. Boy. We're looking for Del Boy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, well, how will that work? I, I've got to tell you, Abramovich for Chelsea, not just the football club for the community. It's been amazing. I mean, what he's done there is unbelievable. And, you know, even with all this, I'd call it a semi-witch hunt, I would say, is about the appropriate words for me. He's put, forget what he bought the club for, forget what he's put into the club. The club actually owe him 1.5 billion as a business. And he has even said, whoever buys the club, I'm not interested in taking my loan back. I'm only interested in Chelsea going forward, which shows the mark of the man because it doesn't matter how much money you've got. There's not many people who would walk away from 1.5 billion. And he has, which I find that remarkable. I'm not sure who's going to buy it. I don't think, George, in my heart of hearts, it's going to be an individual. I think it's going to have to be some kind of consortium, whether it's two, three, four, or five people, I'm not sure. But I can't see another Roman Abramovich coming along again. I can't see it. And obviously, it's going to have to be either a group of Americans, a group of Saudi Arabians, because I'm not really sure who can afford to buy it and then put the money in that, that Roman has put into to maintain the standards of the club. Exactly. Uh, I mean, lucky Chelsea. Uh, Manchester United is owned by a group of Americans. I have no idea if they've ever done any bad things, uh, but I do know that that Manchester United are massively in debt uh, because they purchased the club using debt rather than their own money. Um, Correct. Other teams, uh, Sh Sheffield United and Newcastle United, are both owned by the same family that runs Saudi Arabia, the country that cut the head off my friend Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post uh, columnist. Where are we Correct. going to stop with uh, all of this? Are we going to start looking at the 
political views. I've no idea what Abramovich's political views are, by the way, uh, uh, in England. Uh, I know what they were in Russia. Uh, he's now in Israel, uh, where he's a citizen, uh, and we won't go to what his politics are there. But my point is, if we start hunting down the politics of every owner of every top football club, it's not going to finish at Chelsea. Well, I've got to say, George, you've even got a situation, let's say, at Bournemouth, who could find themselves in the Premier League. And their owner, I believe he's got a British passport, but is Russian. And as you say, if we start to hound down everyone, would the people at Newcastle actually been able to get the club? I mean, I know it took them a long time to pass the fit and proper test, but they were part, as you say, of a family that did what they did. Abramovich, as far as I know, is not part of the family in Russia. He just happens to be Russian. Well, you have, if you're born Russian and Russia do something that the rest of the world don't approve of, which, by the way, I'm not getting into politics. But I think there's a lot more behind this than what meets the eye, but that's another matter. Are you a criminal? Because he's been treated, he's been treated worse than Fred West. I mean, it's quite, it's unbelievable. I have to say, I'm with you, George. Where does it stop? Because if this is only the beginning, what happens next? Exactly so. Uh, exactly so. As I say, uh, I, I hold no candle at all for uh, Abramovich. Quite the contrary. Uh, but he's never done anything in Britain that was wrong. And he's done a lot of good in Britain, in London, in Chelsea, for football. So there's a sense of injustice about it all. But mind you, when Tchaikovsky, who died 130 years ago, can be banned, uh, by the uh, Liverpool, uh, by the Cardiff Philharmonic, and when uh, Dostoevsky, who died 150 years ago, can be banned at the University of Milan, it seems like it is open season uh, on uh, Russians. What about the UEFA and, uh, and the FIFA decisions? They were pretty quick to take a political decision to ban Russia and Russian clubs and sponsorship. Uh, Gazprom must be feeling uh, pretty sore after all the billions they gave to UEFA. Now they're out on their backside. Well, do you want my honest opinion, George? All too Always. Quick. All, all too quick, George. It was as though they were sitting waiting. They have taken sides very quickly. They have not even looked at what this whole situation is really about. They've just made the decision based on I don't know what. That is my personal opinion. They've made a decision on don't know what, and they've decided if you happen to be Russian, you are now a, ma you're a mass murderer. You just got to be Russian. So if you're Russian, you're banging trouble. It doesn't matter what good you've done. It doesn't matter how lovely a person you are. It doesn't matter how much you've helped other people, how much you've helped charities. Whatever you've done in your life, you're now public enemy number one because you happen to have been born in Russia. Now, if you can tell me that is morally correct and legally correct, we might as well all pack the game in, George. Yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, Abramovich could well have challenged all of this uh, legally. He would undoubtedly have won. Uh, but it seems that he's scunnered by the whole thing. To use a Scottish word, he's had enough. Uh, so much so he's going to walk away uh, w without £1.5 billion that he's owed. Um, so it's, it's very sad. But it will be talking uh, more regularly now. We're going to start this uh, football podcast. Uh, we're going to pick your brains uh, about the current state of football and footballers. We're not going to ask you for any professional confidences or even tips 
uh, to bet on, uh, although I might do that <laughs> behind the scenes. Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to explore things about football in our football podcast that don't often get explored. Most football podcasts are about, he went down the right, he crossed it over, the lad nodded it, yeah. and we're going deeper. We're going deeper uh, than that. We're going behind the scenes, as it were. I'm looking forward to it. Are you? I'm oh, really looking forward to it, George. I think it, it's going to be great. It's going to be different because a lot of people, as you say, they don't get asked the questions that they should be asked. Everything is very much, um, very much what everyone already knows. Let's put it that way. We'll be going into territory that will give people an insight. And if you like an education about football and about what really happens with football and what happens in football clubs, players' mentalities, managers' mentalities, and the decisions that are made that the normal supporters, they just see what the media presents or what they know or what they perceive to know. Normally, the reality is something completely different. Absolutely, as I know from conversation with you many a time. Thanks for joining us, Barry, especially when City are playing in the Champions League. But then the game was already won before before um, the second leg uh, yeah, that kicked, was one kicked off. I've been, I, I've been watching Real Madrid and um, PSG, and PSG were leading 1-0 from the first leg. They went one up, and Real Madrid have just equalised. So it's, it's going to be one oh, hell of a... Wow, game. how dramatic a finish that is. Barry, thanks yeah. very much indeed for joining us on the thanks, mother George. of all God talk shows. God bless. God bless you. Let's go to the calls. Odell is in Oldham. Go ahead, Odell. Hi, George. Thanks for uh, getting, listening to my call. Um, I just wanted to Welcome. say it's a breath of fresh air listening to your show today because just bombarded with war psychosis and propaganda everywhere I turn. Um, yeah. To me, it's tough times. It's tough times, Odell. Tough times. It is. It's just, to me, now we're getting to a point where it's like peak 2001 George Bush propaganda, uh, where they, they have the famous line where they say, you're either with us or you're well, with the Well, it's interesting, you, it's interesting you say that, because uh, it is, but I think it's worse. Because in 2001, I did, I we, did, didn't, we, did, we, we didn't have social media. Uh, but now that we've got social media, it's like, I mean, if you were at one of these football matches on Saturday and you didn't sport the colours and, and clap like a seal and and go along with the crowd, you get the feeling you might have got lynched. Definitely, definitely. But I think, obviously, you know, we've got history on our side to say that we wasn't with terrorists. We were just not wanting to see innocent people in Afghanistan and Iraq pay for whatever happened with 9-11. And now I'm just looking exactly. at what's been repeated again. Oliver Stone posted a documentary called Ukraine on Fire. It's been on YouTube for a it's couple of years. It's wonderful. It's so wonderful, Odell, that they've taken it off. Exactly. You, you have to search desperately for it. So much so that the Ukrainian director, the Ukrainian director of Ukraine on Fire, made by uh, Oliver Stone, not director, producer, uh, he is giving it away on Vimeo uh, because it's now so difficult to find in normal channels. It was on sale on Amazon. Amazon ghosted it. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to reiterate that you're 100% spot on to say that you're an idiot if you don't want to hear both sides because you don't have to agree with both sides. You just have, exactly. you can disagree with the other side, but you should at least be able to hear it. Well, exactly. I mean, what value is your disagreement if you didn't even hear the other side? I exactly. mean, that seems to me so obvious. What kind of a country does not want to hear both sides of the story? Only exactly. idiots don't want to hear both sides of the story. Odell, thanks for the call, my friend, uh, in welcome. Oldham. Let's go to David in Hampshire, who's a former soldier. David, go ahead. Hello, George. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, we're often uh, gagged as, uh, as, as members of the military and talking to the media, but over, over this particular subject, um, I feel quite strongly that um, we, were, we were always taught, certainly in the last sort of 10, 15 years of my service, but prior to planning a military operation, there is one fundamental question that you must 
be satisfied that you have an answer to first, which is what is the enemy doing and why? So the question has two very important parts. It's what are they doing? And I think most people would be able to see from what was shown on the news exactly what Russia are doing. But what is not clear is the why. Now, I've heard of, I've seen a couple of your programmes and heard um, a few of your opinions about that. But what do you think right now, or, or at the start of all this, George, is the reason why the Russians are doing what they're doing, please? Well, the proximate reason is in the coup that overthrew the government, the elected government in 2014, violently, very violently indeed. That's the proximate uh, reason, because that changed everything. It changed Ukraine from an avowedly neutral country uh, that was hoping to be a bridge uh, between Russia and the East and the European Union uh, in the West uh, into an explicitly hostile country to Russia. The United States started to move in. Its politicians uh, and their sons all got jobs there and began to make a pile of money there. And the weapons started to flow in. And the Ukrainian government uh, began to openly ask for membership of NATO. As Joe Biden and many other greater men than him have said on record, on tape, you can get it on YouTube, the question of Ukraine joining NATO is a red line for Russia. Uh, it is even more of a red line uh, than Mexico or Canada becoming Russian or Chinese allies and having Russian or Chinese military bases there. It's even more than that because the Russians and the Ukrainians are really one people. They historically were one people. So it's got a kind of civil war aspect to it, uh, this one, which would be unlike uh, the analogy I give of Mexico and Canada. So that's why the proximate reason is the avowed intention of the Ukraine to join NATO and the unwillingness of NATO to formally, in writing, in guarantee, rule that out. Back to you, David. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, clear answer, George. Um, and then following on from that, what do you think it is then that stops mainstream media, including the so-called unbiased BBC, to ignore that aspect of what should be pushed out to every young pair of ears in the UK and across Europe so that we can acquire a better understanding of why Russia is doing what it's doing. And by the way, I must say, I have, uh, I've got three daughters, the youngest of which has a very close friend whose mother is Russian, who's lived in the UK for many years and has integrated into our family and our friendship group and our community and now feels all of the pressures that you've spoken about with your previous caller there of um, being alienated just because you're Russian. And as a former soldier, I feel very, very guilty about that. And why do you think the British media is ignoring those very clear points on the other side, George? Well, David, that's a very beautiful call and a very moving one, and especially coming from you with your military background and your grace in caring about your uh, neighbor, your friend who is Russian, is, uh, is very much to your credit because it is now beginning to happen that people are being chased as Russian when they're not even Russian, which is, of course, inevitable. Uh, a friend of our uh, family uh, was chased down the road in South London as a Russian, even though she was, in fact, French. Uh, this atmosphere of witch hunt uh, with a, a whiff of a crystal nacht in the air, we haven't got uh, there yet, but we may very well be on the way is the reason why I'm pretending to be in London right now when I'm not. 
uh, I have had so many death threats. I literally cannot keep up with them. I cannot send them on to the police. They are so numerous and uh, so uh, so common and so typical. Uh, you're a dead man walking, I get told, 10 times uh, a day. Uh, and the earlier death threats that I've sent to the police, I haven't even heard back from the police about it. So uh, these are very dangerous times for Russians and for uh, the friends of Russia, of whom I'm proud to be one and have been for uh, more than half a century. So virtually all of my life, certainly all of my adult life. Why the media is not doing so, I think you already knew the answer before you asked the question. Uh, our media does not need bribed. It does not need twisted. Uh, it merely uh, follows uh, the orders of the state. And by the state, I don't mean the government. I mean the deep state, I mean the invisible state, I mean the, the dead hand uh, and invisible hand of the state, which is uh, that whatever the United States tells us to do, we do. And we do as a loyal auxiliary, even if it costs us, as indeed this will cost us very, very severely indeed. Free speech, free journalism, Free broadcasting, especially, is dead in Britain. If you didn't have this show to watch, you would have nothing to watch. On this scale, with this level of production values, you would have nothing to watch that rivaled uh, the wall-to-wall. -wall. ITV, BBC, Sky, everything. Wall-to-wall. -wall. Outright, open, unabashed, Propaganda, war, propaganda. Now, I feel sorry for people that only have that to depend on, but anyone with a computer or a smartphone can watch me and can watch the people I have on the show as my guests anytime they like, but they've got to choose to do so. I'll be right back after this break. George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere, where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate. Great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. Uh, now, uh, Osh uh, Lennon, who's a gutless coward, who doesn't have the guts to phone up and say this, has nonetheless written 
The Iraq war defined Tony Blair. The Ukraine war will define George Galloway. A principal difference being I'm actually not waging the Ukraine war, but Tony Blair waged the Iraq war. But if you were a man at all, Osh, you'd phone up and we could have this out man to man. But you're not. You're a gutless coward behind uh, the uh, keyboard. Kevin says, when will they ban Boris Johnson? I understand Boris is of Russian origin. He is indeed. He may have to change his name like the royal family did during the First World War. He'll have to change it to Alexander. Although Sergei and Alexander, it's a bit dodgy, that, but, but it is a bit Russian. Let's hear from Paul in Ottawa. Go ahead, Paul. Hello, George. Uh, I'm honored to be on your show again, and uh, I would like to send thoughts and prayers to uh, you. Uh, that uh, last bit that you talked uh, before the break about how you're just getting death threats, um, it's unconscionable to have somebody of your stature to be put on on that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Oops, Thank you, sir. Thank and um, so uh, with the Venezuela thing, um, I was a young child, six years old in the 70s. I went to Venezuela, and I saw poverty like you never saw before, and I saw wealth, un unbelievable, and the gap was huge. Chavez yeah. comes in. I, I, it, it opened my eyes as a young child. That that's when I really started to have a social conscience, I guess. And Chavez tried to coup him. Oh, well, he's gone. Maduro gets voted in. The people of Venezuela love him. I haven't been there. I don't know the difference between when I was there. and But from what I've heard, it's night and day. No, nope, we got to sanction them and push, push them down more and more and more. They make a deal with Russia. They make a deal with China. Oh, we need your oil. It's just amazing the hypocrisy, the the... <sighs> I don't even know what to say. Like, how, it's like a, a, a bully on a, uh, it's like schoolyard. Oh, you're my friend now. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Oh, you can help me now because we're trying to fight over here. Oh, now I'll be your friend now. It's That's it's, very well expressed, uh, Paul. Very, very well expressed. That's exactly what it is. As to the difference between the Venezuela you saw in the 1970s and the Venezuela before this economic warfare began to be waged by the U.S. against Maduro is night and day. Uh, the poorest, most marginal communities in Venezuela have been, uh, their life has been revolutionized. It has been utterly transformed. Uh, the richest people in Venezuela hate the government, and the poorest people in Venezuela love the government. And that makes me think I should be on the side of the government of Venezuela because uh, judge uh, people by their enemies, the U.S. and the gold-toothed Venezuelan emigres who fled with their ill-gotten gains. They are the people that hate the government of Venezuela. But how, how much of a chump does the high court judge in London now look, the one who handed a billion dollars worth of Venezuela's gold to an imposter called Juan Guaido, who was briefly anointed by the United States and Britain and the European Union as the so-called president of Venezuela. And now Guaido is garbage. He's been dropped in the garbage can of history because the US now is begging Venezuela to sell them their oil. Couldn't make it up. Paul, thanks for the call. Ernest is in Alabama. Let's hear from him. Welcome, Ernest. Hi, George. It's a delight to be on your show. Thank you for being a stand-up man. I Thank would you, like brother. to state unequivocally, we the people stand with Russia. The Donbass is predominantly Russian people. Ukraine is Russia's front porch. They cannot allow NATO to install WMDs on their front porch. Do you agree, George? 
Uh, not only do I agree, I wish I could have said it as succinctly as you just have. That is perfectly, pithily uh, expressed. Uh, the Ukraine is Russia's front porch. It cannot allow hostile WMD on its front porch. Who doesn't understand that, Ernest? I don't know. Uh, it's beyond concept. But we, the people, stand with Russia on this issue. God bless you. Thank you in Alabama. Uh, I, it was a, such a powerful call. Uh, look, it's nearly a record on the uh, polls, 7,150 votes. Now, the record is 8,100. So if we get another 1,000 votes in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, but it, probably the second biggest poll of all time, overwhelmingly uh, people condemn the U.S. Uh, biolabs in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, Mank News, though, says uh, there is proof that the Russians had Novichok and polonium in England and probably used nerve agent in Syria. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that the probable on the nerve agent in Syria uh, bears much examination, uh, Mr. Muse, uh, and neither am I persuaded, neither are many people in Britain persuaded that we know the whole story about the Novichok. Peter G says Putin should probably get a new a Nobel Prize uh, like Obama while the Iraq and Afghanistan war was still active. Um, and Alex says, I have to inform you that as of yesterday, any Australian individual sharing your talking points on social media will be considered as part of a disinformation attack and therefore be considered subject to sanctions. I'm sure that's a joke, isn't it? And John says, however, the misinformation that you peddle daily now has left me wondering if you are a double agent or really are the modern day Lord, spelt wrongly, haw, haw, spelt wrongly. Uh, John, uh, if you had the guts to call, you could have told me what misinformation it is uh, that I'm spreading. But thanks for watching the show, my dear. Daniel is in Florida. Go ahead, Dan. Hi, Mr. George. Nice to hear from you, sir. Go ahead. Um, yes, sir. I just basically wanted to call to kind of um, state my opinion as a as a normal American who is more free thinking. Um, it, it seems to me um, a lot of the disinformation going on from the West is it's scary. You know, when 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 all of our people come together and they all have the single same point of view, when we have so much political strife in this country, that that's your first guess point. And I've never watched your show until recently because I started digging for information on my own. Um, my point is they try to claim Putin is mad. He's a crazy man. To me, Russia is playing chess while NATO thought they were playing checkers. I believe that Russia and Putin are so far ahead of us in this game that the West does not know how to react. That's all they are doing is reacting. I think this man has this strategy planned and plotted, and I don't think there's anything we can do to persuade him. And I just hope when this is all done that the Western media is held accountable for their lies. I hope somehow the Western people wake up and say, my God, the way these people lied to us and hold them accountable in some type of way. To me, journalism, when I was young, I'm 40, journalists were honest. Somewhere along the way that got lost and there's zero accountability. If, if you knowingly put false information into the mainstream, you should be held accountable, whether it be fined, whether it be you lose your job, but they, they encourage it, and, and they've gotten these people. It's, it's incredible to me the extremes they're going to from canceling. I mean, it's, it's madness on a level that I don't think anybody in history has seen or will ever see uh, again. No, I, I, I think you're right, 
Daniel. Uh, I certainly have never seen it, and I'm a lot more than 40. Uh, I have never seen uh, propaganda like this, even when we were actually participants in the war, even when we were waging the war. Uh, now we have a war that we are, on the face of it, not a part of, but the level of propaganda and the associated war psychosis is off the charts, literally off the charts. You've got Tony Blair calling for a Nuremberg tribunal for Vladimir Putin for having committed uh, the supreme crime of launching a war of aggression. Tony Blair, and, and, the man who the killed crimes? a million people in Iraq, along with George exactly. W. Bush. You couldn't uh, that, that, make and, up, and that's Daniel. To the point. Yes, sir, and that's yeah. to the point. Where are the crimes? Because if people paid attention, pay attention. NATO has dropped over 380,000 munitions. Russia's dropped a few hundred. We killed millions of people. If, if Russia was to the extent and to the evil they try to portray them on the television, he wouldn't be wasting. He, he is his own troops. He's costing the lives of his own troops in an attempt to minimize the civilian damage. Well, I that's undoubtedly the- true. I'm glad, I'm glad you made that point because that is undoubtedly true. Every medic, every military man and woman uh, in the world knows that to be true, but none of these journalists has ever seen a shot fired. Well, well ever in say, anger. And, and, and where are the where where are the pictures of the aid trucks going into Ukraine to help people? Only Russia that I've seen on television. Exactly. Only Russia is the only country that all, is sending all, all, all aid into that trucks, country. All of our trucks are filled military. with something different. Daniel, thanks for the call. Exactly. Military. Mike, Thank you. Mike is in uh, South Carolina. Always a pleasure. Mike, go ahead. Hey, George, it's great to talk to you again. And I can't tell you how sorry I am that you're getting these death threats and stuff because it's Thank just you. ridiculous that somebody that can, yeah. you know, spread well, some, yeah. you know, some enlightenment has to deal with that. But, but you know, I called Thank you three you. weeks ago and I, and I told you about, about this whole situation, about the media here and how they were beating the drum for this, you know, kind of like the Iraq war, you know, 2.0. And, uh, and the thing is, uh, they have forced uh, Putin into the situation that he's in right now. Uh, here's what I think might have happened had had that media situation not gone forward and all the propaganda. I think what might have happened is that Russia would have uh, you know, tried to move in and protect the Donbass region over there. OK, and, and, and that is a possibility I and mean, that they might have done that. But it wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't have been this bloody war that we're in right now. But as soon as they start to do this. And the United States, Democrats, Republicans, everybody is already uh, sending and, and, and you know, working out deals to send billions of dollars of weapons, uh, high-tech weapons, you know, Stinger missiles, tank busters, everything, into the country. Now, if, if you were Putin you know, and you wanted to just take over that little region over there in uh, uh, eastern Ukraine – and then you find out that you're going to be sitting there with all of these weapons flowing in. What choice do you have but try to stop the weapons from coming in? And 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 none whatsoever. Limit the damage. No choice. You don't have no any choice, choice whatsoever. No choice. And and Mike, uh, uh, Mike, there, uh, fantastic, yeah. uh, brilliant, brilliant call. Uh, and uh, brevity is the uh, is this the the I core understand. of it. Seven two five zero votes. Uh, have been cast. I'll not bother bother going through uh, what the result was. It was literally overwhelmingly condemnatory of American and Ukrainian bio-warfare labs uh, that have recently been discovered. Let's take a call from London. Uh, Julian is in London. Go ahead, Julian. Hello, George. I was hearing today that several hundred jihadis from Idlib might be on their way to Ukraine uh, to fight again. 480, I think, have arrived so far. Wow. Well, they're into what a could bit of possibly, What could possibly go wrong, Julian? Well, we saw the footage of the Ukrainian nationalists dipping their bullets in uh, pork fat because they hate Muslims, and there's Chechen Muslims coming to fight for the Russians. 
So it would be sad if we saw Muslim on Muslim violence uh, in an already horrific war zone. But that looks like what may happen. Indeed, uh, indeed so. Uh, and of course, the weapons that they are being given uh, are, uh, of course, transferable. They can be fired against Russian targets, but they can also be fired against Western targets. Uh, the Islamist jihadists may stay in Ukraine or they may return uh, to an inhospitable Syria or they may head west for Germany for France, for Britain. Uh, who knows? That's why I ask what could possibly go wrong. The answer, of course, is everything. Julian, thanks for the call. Oswald the Calculator here. What are your thoughts on the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, visiting Russia at the start of the conflict? I'm also a big fan of your show. I hope God gives you the biggest palace in heaven. Oswald, how lovely is that? But I'll settle for a cottage with my good wife in uh, due course. Uh, I take my hat off uh, to uh, Imran Khan. Uh, he could have uh, scurried for cover, but that's not the sort of man that he is. He went there because he was scheduled to go there. And he made deals on gas and on wheat in the interests of the people of Pakistan. That's his job as the prime minister of Pakistan. And uh, Daniel uh, Bakpa says, I love your show. Welcome. I'd like to say that it's unfortunate that people no longer like truth. I'd like to remind everyone that Russia as a world power has contributed immensely to world peace for the last 200 years plus. Napoleon, Hitler, etc. Thanks, Daniel. Ian says, do you believe that when the war is over, the fog has blown and the dust has settled, the truth will come out? and the curtain rises, exposing the false narrative of the MSM of the West. I hope so. I'll be working in order for that to be so, and I hope that you will join me with it. James B. has said, as you have rightly pointed out, Tchaikovsky lived his entire life, as did Dostoevsky, in Tsarist Russia. I remember the media's complicity in the rush to war in Iraq, and I thought I'd seen the worst of the mainstream media bloodlust. But the past fortnight has shocked me, as has the willingness to accept anything and everything Sky, the BBC, Channel 4 News, and all of the print media show and tell. I hope Ukrainian lives will be saved by the Ukrainian government agreeing to terms rather than arming civilians to be slaughtered like 1945 Berlin. That's the best. Uh, message of the night, James. It's absolutely true. And I'm sorry to say, as someone who is very far from uh, naive, that I've been pretty shocked by it too. Uh, Jalau is in Manchester. Let's hear from Jalau. Go ahead, Jalau. Hi, George. How are you? By the grace of God, I'm good. Thanks, sir. Testing, Go ahead. Quickly. Testing times ahead, eh? Yes, yes, very testy. Um, the question is, how many weeks do you reckon before the public hit the streets um, complaining about the high prices of energy and so forth? I don't I'd know. Say within, uh, I'd say I, within three weeks, actually. Well, I hope you're right, but I fear you might be wrong. Uh, the British people have uh, endured uh, so many things that in France, for example, would have brought them out onto the streets in their millions, uh, but the British have not. And whether they will now, as saturated in war propaganda as they are, uh, fall for the lie that actually this is all Russia's uh, fault. Well, even if it is, of course, well, all how, Russia's how, fault, how long which it is it How long? Yeah. Sorry. No, go on. How long? How much longer can people um, afford all this? A lot of people know that it's um, a load of uh, pies in the sky. What's going on? But they just keep. Tend to uh, a keep lot, quiet. yeah. A lot of people. Um, a lot of people but do, once but, it starts but hitting people people's don't. pockets, once it starts hitting people's pockets, it will be happening. I think. Well, I hope you're right. Thanks, Jalal, uh, for that Thank call. You. Andy from Colombia says, "George, great show." I can't help thinking we're experiencing 
the start of the downfall of the U.S. empire. What worries me is that they will go down fighting. Andy in Colombia, thank you, Andy, for that. Anthony says, George, just listen to Ray, the ex-Air Force guy, not sorry for invading Iraq. How wrong I seem to be in believing that to join the Royal Air Force, you needed at least some indication of intelligence. And Tony says, for those of us who have family and friends in Russia and Ukraine, let's hope for a smooth liberation of an extremely radicalized nation. Is the poll closed now? It's 7,250, and it is simply overwhelmingly hostile to the biolabs that were found in Ukraine, none of which were declared, of course, none of which were informed through the OSCE to Russia, and all of which appear to have been up to the devil's work, or Victoria Newland would not be so worried about them falling into Russian hands. There's a legend on the line. It's the one and only Norma in Bristol. Norma, welcome to the show. Hello, George. I, I hope you stay safe. I, I worry Thank about you. you a bit. Um, I was, well, I, with this chap, what was his name, Barry Sitman? He said... Barry Silkman, he, yes. Silkman, that's right. Where does this stop? Now, this is about Russian tennis players, not football. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in Indian Wells, the tennis tournament starts today in America. And I looked on the order of play, and the two Russian women players were the only ones that didn't show the name of their country. They usually show the name and then the country. Uh, the other thing about these um, tennis players is number one player in the world at the moment is a bloke called Daniel Medvedev. Now, he's very, very good, and he might win the tournament. But I'm very worried about he's going to be vilified. Um, these people, they play for themselves. They're not there to represent their country. And, um, you know, this po- it's getting so stupid. Don't you think? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty overwhelming, uh, this. Um, it's uh, People are being asked, including Medvedev, uh, to denounce their own country in order to be allowed to participate in sport at all. Uh, ballerinas, opera singers, mm-hmm. orchestral conductors, yeah. uh, uh, actors, directors, producers. People uh, are being asked are being told that they must denounce their own country with all the consequences that that will have when they go back home, of course, uh, or uh, a Formula One driver, or be uh, forbidden to practice their trade. Where's the legality of all that? Where's the morality of all that, Norma? Well, yeah. I mean, there was one chap, he won in Dubai, because I'm a tennis fan, about two weeks ago. I can't quite remember his name. He was Russian. And he wrote when he finished the game, they write on a little piece of thing, paper, like, and he put, no war, and he was a Russian. I mean, it just, it really gets me. Um, well, it's George, collective punishment, isn't it, Norma? It's mm, collective yeah, it punishment. It is. And the other thing was, George, um, if you ever had music on your show, I suggest... We're not allowed. We're not allowed it. We don't oh, have, I uh, wish you We don't could. have the rights to it. I wish no. we could. But tell but us, what should I play? And we'll Verdi, imagine it. Verdi's Requiem, Dies Irae, which is the wrath of God. It's angry, great music, but my God, it's good for your soul. If I wish you could play it. I'll play it on my way back to my digs. There you go, Norma. Yeah. Thanks very much. It make you feel Indeed. better. Thank you for a lovely call. Thank you for a lovely show. I hope you think it was worthwhile. I think it was, but only you can tell. Uh, So let me know uh, on social media. Let me know uh, by uh, building the audience for Sunday. It's really important. Uh, The main show will continue to be on Sunday nights at 7 o'clock. I hope if I can put the resources together, to keep bringing out a midweek show. Uh, I hope you think that's worthwhile. Let me know if you do. It's been marvellous for me. 
I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back on Sunday, same time, same place. Go in peace. <laughs>